Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Farnham Heath End virtual options evening. We're going to do our best to answer all the questions that you've uh, put in already through the Google form. Um, and then any questions that you've got, you can put in the chat stream on YouTube and we'll get through those as well. We've got all the heads department coming this evening who will be able to answer your specific questions. But this session obviously is about more general questions that you might have about the options process or about GCSEs in general. Mr. Wallace is going to look to the questions and pose them and I will primarily answer these questions. And then later on, you might see me disappear because I'll be working in the background at uh, managing the technology. So really lovely to welcome you all here. And I'm going to hand over to Mr. Wallace to pass it through the first question. Cool. Uh, some absolutely brilliant questions coming here, guys. So thank you very much to everyone who has who has posed a question. Uh, first question, Miss Hockey. Is a student able to take both history and geography at GCSE or does he have to choose one or the other? So, so question we have quite a lot. Um, yes, of course, a student can choose both history and geography. And we I would actually recommend that for many students, that would be a fantastic combination, um, allowing them a really great understanding of the world and how it develops. Um, they are obviously two highly regarded GCSEs. And therefore, we would um, recommend that for students. They are all exam based and they do they are quite knowledge heavy as well. So just bear that in mind when you choose your options, whether you think that is going to be suitable for you. But yes, you most definitely can choose between those two. You can have both of those. And we recommend that every student does at least one of those object, um, options. Lovely. Uh, thank you very much. So the next question that we have got is, as well as number grading, will their grades be, for example, an A or a B or is it just numbers? So the few, a few years ago, the GCSE grading system changed in line with the new GCSEs that came out. So if you've got older siblings that have got older children that have gone through the school, they will have received the old A star to G. Those were completely replaced under the new curriculums with the grades one to nine, where roughly a C is now equal to a four. And then this new grade five sort of bridged the gap between a top C and a low B. And then the seven was an A, and then you're, they added in this top extra grade of a nine. And that's the difference between them. The majority of school subjects will only have those grades nine to one and every single grade is a pass. So depend, I know what you hear in the media about what's a standard pass, what's a strong pass. Every single grade is a pass, but different qualifications further on. Different um, qualifications which have a different vocational qualifications and each one of those has a grading system specific to it so it will depend on the qualification will depend on what you have and it will be explained in more detail later on what that is but for a BTEC for example there's a pass a merit a distinction and a distinction star and a pass is equivalent to a grade four with a merit being equivalent to around between the grade five and grade six, and then a um, and then a, a distinction is worth a grade seven, and distinction star is a grade eight. So there's a slight difference between uh, those ones and uh, their gradings, but they're roughly equ um, equivalent. The other one that we have that's different is uh, the film studies AS. And because that's an AS level, that still does have the old A, B, C grading system. And an AS is halfway between an a GCSE and an A level. It's the old advanced subsidiary level. Cool. Lovely. Thank you very much. Um, so the next question is, is my son or daughter allowed to do two of the creative subjects? I know that... Um, a lot of students will be thinking, will be a little bit sad they can't do two of those, and we do appreciate that. 
However, we don't advise it and we don't allow students to do two of those subjects uh, for various reasons. The biggest one being the amount of work that actually is involved in them in terms of portfolio work. And then when it comes to the exam time, the amount of work that has to go into that. So we aren't allowing students this year to do two of those subjects. So I so that might be slightly disappointing. So um, that's just two from the art, art textiles and DT block. There are other creative subjects such as music, drama, dance, which are still considered creative where students can, can still do something that's less written heavy. Cool. Lovely. Thank you very much. Um, we had a question coming from on the chat. And the question is, how important is the suggestion to take a foreign language? Can you still go down the university track without it? Which is a really good question. Yeah, it is. And I know that this is quite a challenging one for many students and parents. You can still go to university without it. There is only UCL demand that you have a GCSE in a language. The issue comes when you are applying to university, you are competing against every other child of the same age as you who've been to school. And when we are, we're a, a comprehensive school, so they are competing um, against students who've been to grammar school and who've been to private school to go to those best apprenticeships and also onto the best university qualifications. What we want students to do is to achieve for the best. And we want them to be able to compete with those students. And therefore, those students who've been to private school generally and those students who go to grammar school are required to take a language. And it just gives them that ability to compete on that respect because the language is considered to be, well, it's just very well regarded. It's highly considered in, those, uh, in terms of employment and in terms of academic qualifications. And that is the thing is, it's reputation. There is also now the um, issue of Brexit and some research that has been done since Brexit is around the need for languages. This has always been present, but with Brexit, unfortunately, that need to be able to communicate with industries within Europe is really important. And being able to have a language at GCSE shows that you have that ability to take a language and maybe do a different one. So it's not just about the language itself, it's about the skills it provides you as well. And we do recommend it for those students who have, we suggest if you've had a key stage two reading score of 100 or higher, we really do recommend it to enable you to compete later on in life. Lovely. Uh, we'll get them filled out in the Google form. Um, a really good question here is, will every lesson be two periods long? So technically we have three lessons in a day as opposed to six. So that's a, that's a fantastic question. It isn't one I would have ever thought about answering on an options evening. So well done to the person who put that question um, out there. So we move from having primarily single lessons in year seven, year eight to having a, sign a significantly more double lessons. So for um, the course, so science will now in year nine, 10, 11, it always doubles. So they'll have two, three 100 minute science lessons a week, one biology, one chemistry, one physics. For maths and English, they have five lessons, two of which are doubles. They have two doubles and a single a week. And then for options, every options is three lessons long, which is a double and a single. So for some, uh, some days, they will have three doubles. And perhaps on other days, they might have two doubles and two singles. And that will depend on how the timetable is written for next year. Cool. Lovely. And we've got lots of really good questions coming in the yeah. chat. There are some that I'm going to save for the heads of department because I think they'll be able to give you some really good detail on that. But one that's just come in. Can you take more than nine GCSEs? Um, in US, yeah, of course, you can take more than nine GCSEs. And we do have a large number of students who take optional and elective GCSEs every year. Again, they do tend to be um, in languages where they've either got a background in a language um, from home or they have self-studied it, which obviously is possible. Um, and you can do that. We sometimes offer GCSEs as optional extracurricular. Um, one that does tend to come up is a mass, an extra mass qualification, and that can be done. So, yes, you can. But in terms of what they opt for as their core offer, 
it is nine GCSEs, so that's English language, literature, maths. Everyone does at least two sciences and four options, which is nine. If you then do triple science, it becomes 10. So it will depend, but yes, you can do more, but it would be outside of your normal timetable. Um, the, there's a couple of questions. One question I really want to address, which is around the P, the sports science difference. Students cannot take both P and the Cambridge National. That's not allowed, unfortunately. Um, but the difference between them is one is vocational, which means it's coursework based with a smaller exam. And then the GCSE sports science is it has a larger theoretical part to it, but you still have the practical. But the uh, so it's the how the exams work that's the difference. And there's one more question in the chat that I would like to address, which is regarding languages. So we don't offer Spanish at the moment. Um, that just because we don't have the teachers who can teach that at this present time, that's the, the simplest reason for that one. Um, if you do outside of school, we can then enter you inside of school for it, or you can be entered through a college for that one. As I've said, we do have a number of students who take languages um, outside uh, as private candidates in school, and we enter them for that if they have a background in it. So if you are bilingual in certain languages, there are the, there is the option to do that. So in the past, we've done Bengali, uh, we have done Urdu, I think, and we've also done I've done Chinese, uh, Turkish, Portuguese, and Japanese. They have cut down the number of those home language GCSEs, so we would need to see if there's a qualification available, but those ones are available for you. Okay, cool, thank you. Uh, I'm gonna go back to some of the questions that we've got here. Um, a really good question is, uh, will COVID-19 affect our future GCSE studies? And I think that might be something that's really concerning for students at the moment and probably their parents too because of the messages that we hear in the media around lost learning and that there's a learning deficit and it's quite negative for students to hear that I think. I think the first thing that I need to reassure students is they will not be adversely affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, their teachers and the school will do everything they can to support young people. Um, current year eight students are in a fantastic position because they'll be starting their GCSEs in year nine um, and therefore have the full three years to um, progress through that GCSE. And so that is not at all a problem. I do not envisage it being a problem for young people. If it is a problem, we adapt to it and we support you through it and we do everything we can to support you with that. And the only thing that you need to do is turn up every day do the best work you possibly can, and then you will do wonderfully. And that's all I can say really in regards to that one. Fantastic. Um, so just looking through some of, I think you've answered uh, the question uh, with regards to why, uh, why we start GCSEs in year nine as opposed to year 10. There's another question on here from the Google form. Um, can you explain the difference between Russell Group Pathway and Professional Pathway? Would I still be able to go to a Russell Group University if I picked the professional pathway? Yeah, so the professional pathway, of course, now the difference purely between those two is uh, the, um, the language option. So we do recommend if you are applying to the Russell Group universities that you do take a language and that's purely the difference for that, okay? That's the only difference within those two. Uh, some of you might be asking about the professional pathway and can you go to university with that? Yes, you can. Certain universities will have very specific um, guidance on what qualifications they want for certain courses. I do recommend if you are thinking about courses like medicine, you are thinking about something like dentistry, like architecture to become a lawyer, um, those sort of very traditional professional um, uh, professions. Like, I highly recommend that you do four GCSEs over the BTEC. And again, that's to put you in the best possible situation to compete in later life against other uh, uh, students and young people as well. And it's about making sure you've got those best opportunities. 
Um, I can see we've got quite a few more questions who've come in. We've got another general slot at the end of the evening at seven o'clock where we'll pick up some more of these questions. And I would like to say thank you so much for doing that. And I'm going to uh, bring in the heads of core now, which will be able to answer some of those questions for you. Um, Miss Dawes is here instead of Miss Shadbolt this evening. So thank you so much. And I will see you again later. Hello, how are you all doing? Good, thank you. Hi, good, evening, everyone. Good, evening. Good, evening. good evening. Good evening. Uh, we d we've got loads of questions, so I'm gonna I'm gonna fire straight in with uh, one that was coming from the chat, and that one's gonna be for uh, you, Miss Bert Whistle. Could you please just explain how, uh, how? Well, firstly, the difference between uh, combined and separate sciences and also how students are able to do either separate sciences if they prefer to or combined sciences and how that works. So the main difference is the uh, content. Uh, so there is more content and also at a much higher level for separate award. The, the other difference is the length of um, the exam papers with separate award. Um, and the, 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 oh, oh. I had a third one it will come back to me but in terms of being selected for it or deciding to do that course you'll be um all students will start off uh, following the same course from year nine and we do not make decisions about whether students um are better suited for separate or combined award until uh, later on in year 10 and 11 so students will have all the opportunities um they want if they want to try for separate award or if they'd rather uh, follow combined science award. Oh, the third difference was that with separate awards, they'll get three GCSE certificates, and with combined higher, they will get two GCSE certificates. Thank you very much, Ms. Burke. Well, so just, just to add on to that, another really common question that we have had coming in is if my son or daughter is looking to go into medicine, how essential is uh, trip uh, would be would be separate sciences for that sort of it, it would be um, recommended that they did separate award scientists for dentistry medicine veterinary any of those sciences um, however combined science higher can also um, give them access to grades sevens eights and nines which would be needed for any kind of research or medical background um, degree course fantastic thank you very much um, I'm going to go over to Mr Newman um, a question that we have got here is what is the difference between the higher and foundation tier? Do they study the same? Do they study the same things? So English actually isn't a tiered subject. So a difference there between English and the other core subjects, we have we don't have tiers. Uh, so every student will sit the same exam paper and the way those exam papers are structured and the way the mark scheme is structured means that you can access anything from a grade one all the way up to a grade nine by doing that. Fantastic. Thank you very much. So I'll, I'll flip that question on to Miss Dawes then because they do have a higher end foundation tier in math. So uh, Miss Dawes, can I just ask that question again? What is the difference between the higher end foundation tier? So in maths, the difference between higher foundation, as um, Ms. Burt also said in science, is content uh, mainly and the ability to gain certain grades. So in a foundation tier in maths, you're going from a uh, one to a five and in higher tier, you're going from a four to a nine. Um, and so the content reflects this. So there is a lot of crossover topics in the middle, but the foundation will focus on more basic skills, whereas the higher will go into more complex um, topics. Um, but exactly as they said in science, it's not a decision that we're going to be making uh, at the moment or even in year nine, year 10. That's something that um, is decided much later down the line in year 11. And we start off teaching everybody exactly the same. Every class um, has the opportunity to learn all foundation and higher tier topics. And classes follow the same scheme of work at the same pace. Um, and it's only later down the line when that will diverge slightly depending on certain students' needs. Thank you very much. Okay, great. I'll go back to you, Mr. Mr. Newman. Um, what do you study within English? What do you what do you study within two separate Englishes as well? 
Yeah, so um, as you said there, so obviously English is actually two separate GCSEs. They'll get two separate GCSE grades. For some students, those are the same, but they also often are different as well. Uh, for English language, that's sort of broadly divided into two sections, which then becomes the two papers. So paper one is broadly the study of fiction texts. So they have to read, analyze fiction texts, and then also write their own fiction text creatively as well. Um, and then uh, paper two, which is nonfiction, same format. So they have to read and analyze nonfiction text. There's also a comparison element on that paper. Um, and then they have to write their own nonfiction text. So they might have to be asked to write a speech or a letter or an, or an article. Uh, for literature, um, again, that's divided into two papers, but instead we actually tend to think about it in terms of texts um, and, and each uh, text will have its own unit of, of work that we that we do with the students and we, we sequence that very carefully. Uh, so they will study a Ro uh, Romeo and Juliet, their Shakespeare text. They will study A Christmas Carol as their 19th century novel. Together those make up paper one. Uh, and then they will study um, an Inspector Calls as their, um, what's called the modern text. So Inspector Calls is a, is a play from the 20th century. Um, uh, they will study the Power and Conflict cluster from the AQA anthology. So that's a, a collection of poems that is put together by AQA themselves. Um, and then there's also an unseen poetry element to that, which as the name suggests, they are given a poem that they have never seen before in the exam and they have to use the skills they've learned over the course of the three years to analyze and respond to that. Um, I'll just very quickly, I can see in the chat as well, someone said our students set in English. Um, they um, uh, are in the sense we have a top set. Um, um, so we 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 have that, that there for those students really to try and push those for the top grades, but everybody else is then in mixed ability classes. Um, it's also really important to emphasize along with that, we adjust sets all the time. So they are by no means fixed. Uh, so um, a student can, can move between sets depending on their needs at any time. And also we um, uh, um, all follow the same schemes of learning. We all follow the same uh, um, sequence in terms of uh, how we teach the curriculum. So if they are to move, um, then that shouldn't affect their progress or that shouldn't disadvantage them in any way. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Mr. Newman. And Miss Burwistle, there's another cracking question in the chat. Yeah, uh, I can do see. Or do you decide whether our children should follow combined or separate science? So that decision is made between the, the teachers, myself, the students and the parents. Um, and, um, and, and of course, the 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 most important decision is um, whether the student wants to make that commitment to do separate science in particular or whether they want to um, make a sideways move, move and do combined science higher but it is a decision by the student and the teachers and the parents predominantly because um, they have to feel confident that they'll be able to cope with the the concepts the higher concepts and the length of papers that they'll need to be assessed on in in three years time um, the, there was another science question about veterinary and I would recommend that if your daughter is interested in doing veterinary science, uh, veterinary um, a course, that they do do single science, they do separate award science, we call it. Um, but not everything is flexible and students' cognitive ability changes over the three years. So if they're in combined science and they want to go, try for separate award science, we do not, um, like Ms. Newman said, we don't uh, fix anything in stone um, until very late into year 11. So there's still a chance for any student to, to, to have a go, to, to do it. Lovely. Cool. Thank you very much, uh, Miss Birtwistle. And Miss Dawes, um, what sort of careers could maths take our students in uh, the direction of in the future was one that we had. Yeah, gosh, that's a, a massive question because my answer would be every single career really would rely on maths. I mean, there are a few named um, that uh, that we, we said before. Um, I mean, just on top of my head, anything that involves um, finance, uh, or numbers obviously is going to be really, really important. Um, I've seen loads of really good um, information about cyber security um, and, um, and that kind of thing being, being used 
for, for math skills, engineering, which is an, a massive one that crosses between science and maths. Um, there are lots of different strands in engineering, which students may want to eventually go on and study at university or do some sort of training in. Uh, but really, every, every, um, every job is going to use an element of maths. There's some that will be um, more academic. There's some that will be more, um, more useful type of uh, everyday maths, but really, uh, maths is going to be useful in, in every um, every career. And the other thing to say is with the core subjects, uh, for a lot of jobs, um, they're going to ask for you to have a certain grade in your maths and your English and potentially your science. So it is always really good to focus on regardless of career, what career you're going to have. Can I get that for in, in maths and English particularly? Oh, we can't hear you, Miss Hockey. Thank you. The standard, uh, uh, you're on mute, uh, has come back into play. Um, so I want to say thank you to our heads of core, that's Miss Bert Whistle, Mr Newman and Miss Dawes for joining us this evening. And I hope we hope that we've had um, the quest the your questions answered. So thank you very much for joining us. I'm going to take this opportunity while we're waiting for the next set of HODs um, to uh, answer some of the more general questions that perhaps have um, come in over this time uh, so uh, one question that's coming regarding why we're doing the virtual tasters next week and couldn't we wait until we came back face to face the um, obviously the plan was put in place before we knew what the exact uh, guidelines were going to be regarding opening um, and obviously when we found that out on Monday we'd already planned to do our tasters next week and our staff have planned for that when we are back face to face, there are actually going to be some tasters that are going to be done face to face due to some planning arrangements we have to make internally. Um, and actually, the majority of the subjects they'll be doing anyway, when they are back in school, we do want them then to be back focused on their learning, focused on getting back into routine and doing it that way, which I think would be far better for them than disrupting it with lots of different subjects. And also it will push it back a bit because of the way we've got to do the staggered entrance as well because of testing. And you will get more information about that. Um, and it's not the time or place to go into that. So we do feel the virtual tasters are better. This means that all students get access to them um, and can do all those tasters um, and give them plenty of time then to reflect on the tasters before the deadline for the options form, which is at the end of March. Um, a couple of other little questions that someone said is, what's the difference between GCSE and EBAC? I'm fully aware as in education that it is full of acronyms and various weird letter combinations that we use um, quite freely because we are in it every day that some people might not quite uh, see the difference. So GCSE is the qualification. It stands for General Certificate of Secondary Education, and that's for each of the different subjects. The EBAC is an abbreviation for something called the English Baccalaureate. And what that means, that's a collection of subjects that are considered and highly regarded by employers and by universities. And they are maths, English, the sciences, which also does include computer science as well. And then the humanities, which is history and geography, and then MFL. And that's what makes up the EBAC group of subjects. They're very traditional. Um, in terms of the fact they've been being studied for uh, a long period of time um, and they're, for that sense because of the academic level and rigour of those subjects well regarded by academic uh, by the institutions such as university and, um, and also uh, uh, employers as well. Um, I think one question that's come in some said will they be able to get extra help in any subject? Of course you will be able to get extra help. Uh, your teachers will always be available if you need it we don't envisage lots of students needing extra help. And then we put on specific sessions for targeted students as we get through into sort of year 11 is when we start to do proper revision and targeted spotlight sessions to support with. And whilst we're waiting for the other HODs, Ms. and Mr. Was, are there any other questions that, um, what that might be worth answering now uh, yeah there was a really good one that came in on the google form which we didn't have time for earlier uh, if my son or daughter uh, if my son or daughter wants to change their option how does this work so we um allow a cooling like a, a cooling off period or a change period and normally we run that from september when they start until the half term um october half term 
Although we're really aware at the moment, some students will have uh, varying experiences due to COVID. So one of the things we will be reacting to is that, and the period we did this year for year nine, it's worked really well, is it will run till Christmas. We ask you to give it a couple of weeks to change it before you change your options. So we don't allow options to change in the first two weeks. And that's just so that classes can settle and you can get into routine because obviously coming back, all your classes are going to be different. Uh, it's going to be very, very different to year seven and eight where you've been with your form. That is not going to be the case anymore. So we ask, we wait a couple of weeks and then the process will be that you have to. So you generally have to come and see me. Uh, my office is really easy to find by reception. And then you talk to me about what you want to change from and what you want to change to. And you talk to me about why. And we look to see if that's possible, because by then the blocks are fixed. And sometimes we can't always do that. If it works, we got you go. Uh, I then need an email or a letter uh, from parents or carers to give approval that you're happy for that to happen. And once that's done, it's then changed in our system and they start the next day pretty much. Um, once, as soon as I've got that letter, they start straight away in the new subject. Obviously, they're expected to catch up on work that they've missed. Um, and, um, you know, so the longer they leave it, the, you know, the more work they do have to catch up. So we, I tend to advise really October half term is best, but for some students, we do leave it up until Christmas and that will be in place for year eight this year. So going into year nine. I'm going to welcome in the heads of what we call the EBAC subject. So that's Miss Sarazen for MFL, Mrs. Atherton uh, for geography, and Mr. Jones for history. And you'll be able to pose your questions uh, for to them. Okay. Thank you. Hi guys, how are we doing? Very well, Mr. Wally. Fantastic, thank you, sir. Yeah, Good great, stuff. Thank you. Uh, good. We'll get straight into it. We've got we've had loads of questions coming in sort of on the Google Forms, which is great. And we've also had lots of questions coming in uh, on the chat throughout. So hopefully we get some directed for your subjects. Uh, the first question I've got is for multiple languages. So Mr. Sarazen, what is the advantage of taking a language? Well, obviously, I have a passion for languages, but I think for our, our learners and our students, the advantage of taking it is that it gives you a very broad skill base. Um, Miss Hockey mentioned the EBAC subjects, and we are part of that group of subjects, which um, future employers or college, university, you know, whatever way you're going next, like to see these group of subjects because it gives you a broad skill base and a broad skill set, um, as well as obviously being a huge advantage to be able to communicate in a foreign language and the direct hard skills and soft skills that you will learn by following the course. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Uh, and we will move on. That's great. So uh, next question. Um, so this one's for Miss Atherton. Uh, what do you study in geography? Is a question we got. This is really broad. It's actually quite difficult. We study nine topics. Um, we start off with hazards. So we look at all hurricanes, volcanoes, all the really exciting geography. And then we move through to development, um, obviously looking um, at India and Mumbai as our case studies. And we look at how those places have developed over time, which is absolutely amazing to see the changes even in a really short space of time as well. Um, then we move on and we do field work. How that's going to change in the future um, is still up for some debate. We're still waiting to hear from our exam board as to how that's going to happen because we haven't unfortunately done field work now for a little bit of time. Um, but there's always the option of doing this virtually, which I've done many a time before. And um, so that's an easy thing to change. And it's still as exciting and as fun as you'd normally do it. Um, and then the last unit, which is three topics, go into looking at biomes. So looking at the tiger rainforest, um, the tiger and the rainforest. Um, and also looks, um, has crosses over into science with renewable energies, sustainability um, as well. So it's really broad, the different topics that we study. Cool. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Jones, history. What careers are history? Well, what careers are history useful for? Many careers. Obviously, the obvious example is uh, history teaching, but we won't stay with that one. Archaeology, law, media, politics, research, any type of 
job you want to do involves finding out evidence, looking at who's arguing, building a case, talking, making a judgment. It's useful for most, 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 most careers and qualifications. Brilliant. Lovely. Thank you very much. That's great, Mr. Jones. Uh, and we've had a really good question come into the chat for Miss Atherton. If you have an interest in social sciences for A-level, so politics or sociology, is geography the best way in? I'm sure Mr. Jones will have a bit of a battle uh, with Miss Atherton about this one. So um, I'll let Miss Atherton go first uh, and then we might listen to Mr. Jones as well. Um, so I'm going to be really on the fence about this. Geography and history are both good ways in. Um, they both require analytical skills. You have to evaluate. I know in both subjects as well, there is a lot of not essay writing at GCSE level for geography in particular. There are a lot of eight and 12 mark questions, which our students, you guys will have already practiced in geography extensively. Um, there's the skill set that you will get from doing either geography or history will provide you with a good skill set for doing the social sciences later. However, as a human geographer, the social sciences would provide a really good inlet into that. I did psychology at A-level um, and then focus on human geography as my degree and obviously having a basis and an understanding of people and their environments really helped me with my psychology. And I got a really high mark for my psychology um, equivalent of A-level as well because I had a really good footing for it from geography. Great. Thank you very much, Ms. Afton. Much more political than I thought it might be. Uh, Mr. Jones, I'll ask you a different question. Uh, we've had <laughs> a lot of chat. Uh, uh, you study and are there lots of essays to write? Uh, what do we study? Well, first, I want to say that history does lend itself to social sciences very well as well. Looking at background and cultures where we come from is really important. In terms of what we study, we study four key units. German history from the beginning of Germany to the end of World War II, the Cold War from 45 to 72, Elizabeth I and her medicine through time. Are there essays? Well, there are some essays, but not that many. Every single exam paper for each subject topic has one extended writing question. So there's one in each paper. So we've had a couple of questions which are very similar on the chat and uh, it'll be a good one to answer. Okay, um, is that the swapping question? Sorry, you cut out there. Oh, sorry, yeah. Can, can you yeah. from each how yeah, much? No. Um, unfortunately, you, you can't. And we don't have the facility to take what we call ab initio French or German at GCSE, which would be taking it from scratch. Um, because of the demands of the GCSE course, it is not designed to be taught from scratch. Um, and especially with um, the time missed prior to starting year nine, um, in terms of lockdown, we, we cannot offer that facility um, at the moment, unfortunately. So you need to, you can only continue with the language that you have started. Very much. Uh, Miss Atherton, we've got another good question in the chat here. What are the career options uh, that you can do if you have geography? So these are really extensive. Um, you can choose something that's really what I call a pure geography sort of subject or career path. So looking at volcanology, um, going over to Iceland and measuring all the volcanoes that are over there, looking at the mid-Atlantic drift is amazing. Um, you can also do things like cartography, be involved um, with the census. Obviously this year is census year and be extensively involved in that. There are an awful lot of geographers or people that have done um, a geography degree that I know are involved in COVID and putting out the vaccinations and how that works. Um, I have a friend who did geography with me and she is now a diamond merchant for Tiffany's. Um, so something completely different. Um, but you can also give you a good basis for law, um, anything where you need to be critically evaluating as well, the police services, um, fire and rescue, obviously. Um, and I think the military as well, obviously gives you a good basis for that. There are obviously the skills that you will learn, you can easily attribute to a wide set of career paths like you can in a lot of our other subjects as well. Brilliant. Cool. Thanks. Uh, Mr. Jones, this was a question on the Google form. Um, if I want to study history at university, do I need to have done this at GCSE? <laughs> it would certainly help you study at GCSE. I wouldn't say it's necessary. But I think mean, effectively at degree level, you need to have a firm grounding at GCSE level. So yeah, definitely. I'd suggest you would. 
Awesome. And another question that we uh, have had in the Google form, and this was for uh, Miss Sarazen, um, is uh, are more modern foreign languages tiered? If so, what is the difference? Okay, so when you come to take your exam at the end of year 11, you are entered for either higher tier or foundation. But that decision isn't made until after your mock exams in year 11. Um, and the decision is based on your expected grade. So, for example, um, if you are expected to achieve a grade five, four, three, two, you know, whatever. Um, but if grade five is, is really where you're working at, then you would do a foundation level. If, however, um, you are working towards and looking as though you're going to be achieving a grade six or above, you would be entered in for the higher level examination. Um, on your GCSE results, though, it will just say French or German and the number. It doesn't say anything about whether it was higher or foundation. So a five at higher equates the same as a five at foundation. It's purely um, for the different levels of language. That's all. Cool. Lovely. Thank you very much. Um, there's a little geography on the Google form. I think I to all, all three of you. Um, are, so I'll ask Miss Atherton first. Um, are there any opportunities to go on any trips within uh, GCSE geography? Um, so unfortunately, the Iceland trip, um, as many of obviously our year eights will know, was cancelled. Um, COVID unfortunately hit. Um, so there is still an international trip. There still is um, international trip will be in the pipeline for when we can obviously get out and about. Um, we do an awful lot of virtual field work and geography like in the classroom. We've got headsets um, that we use going off and obviously using that in the same way that you would use like virtual reality. Um, and then it will really depend what the exam board say about field work. There is a field work component which is compulsory um, or has been in the past compulsory for examinations, which will involve um, a trip to a local river, um, getting the wellies in on and going into the river and taking loads of measurements to look at different aspects of the river and how it changes profile. Um, and then there'll also be something that will look at a local um, town um, and how it's obviously um, changed over time comparing two areas as well. But unfortunately, until we hear more from the example, we can't confirm when that will happen and what there will look like. Okay. Oh, it happened again, Miss Hockey. Yep, and it's happened again, yes. Um, and um, I'm going to come in here and I'm going to say thank you to our Heads of History, MFL and Geography. Thank you very much for joining us this evening and thank you for all your wonderful questions. And I'm going to let them go whilst we wait for the next set of uh, um, uh, Heads of Department to come in. And I'm going to answer a couple more questions that are a bit more general uh, that have come through. So thank you very much, Miss Sarahs and Miss Jones and Miss Atherton. Thank Take you. Care. Thank you. Thank you. Um, there's been a couple of questions about uh, combinations of option subjects and whether you can or can't do them. So um, the ones that you cannot do together are art, art textiles and de uh, design text. You can only take one of those three and then you can only take one from dance, P sports science and the sports science Cambridge National. They're the, they're the main ones you cannot do. So you can do any other combination. So I've had people ask, can my child do computer science and design technology? Yes, they can definitely do that. Can they do film studies and art? Yes, they can definitely do that one. And there was another question related to the film studies around will it still be um, an option subject? It would take up one of your options. So you would do that and three other options um, as well. Uh, one question has just come in the chat uh, around uh, homework for GCSE. It is still based around KO learning because um, the, you need that basic fundamental knowledge, but it is done differently. So it isn't that it's all in one booklet for half term. You get a booklet per subject because it's got all the knowledge in. Some of those can't be printed because it's too much. It does extend, though, as you go through your GCSE into what we call method two of KO. So that's more than just rote learning. That's application where you be set GCSE style questions or other questions to answer based on the knowledge organizer. So that does change slightly as well. 
And another question that's come through uh, around how year nine works that's different to year seven and eight perhaps was around, do they change forms at GCSE? And no, they don't. They stay in the same tutor groups um, throughout the time they're in school. So they don't change forms, but what is different is all their teaching groups will completely change. So we remix bands. So they'll be, in, you know, obviously they're going to be with some of the same students. So that's, you know, undoubtable. You can't get away from that one. But they will have different children in their maths and English classes, different children in their science classes, PE classes, and their option subjects are completely mixed throughout the whole year group. It's a really good chance to make some new friends and um, to work with different people as well. And I'm going to welcome now uh, Miss Overton and Miss Daly. And they're going to join us uh, to talk uh, to answer your questions about art and art textiles and DT as well. And Mr. Newell is just joining us here as well. Hopefully he'll come in in a minute to um, be able to answer our questions uh, for design technology. So I'll hand over to Mr. Wallace and he will pass over the questions and I will see you again soon. Hi, guys. How are you doing? Hello, Mr. Wallace. Thank Hello. you for hosting us. Uh, Hi, Mr. Wallace. Sorry, my camera doesn't appear to be working. I've no idea why, but uh, you might just have to work on audio. No problem. We can get it to work. Sorry about that. Clear. So don't worry. It's 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 no problem at all. Um, so I think we'll start with uh, Miss Daly. We had some really good questions coming in on the Google form. So the first one is how much of the course is practical? So art textiles. How much of the course? Is practical? <laughs> This is a really funny one because actually, if you look at the Art Textiles course at GCSE, um, all the different assessment objectives, so there's four assessment objectives, there's actually a practical element that can be incorporated into all of them. What I would say is certainly at the beginning of the course, um, we need to make sure that students are confident about writing and reading about our textiles. So therefore, um, we do do kind of quite a lot of written work just at the introduction to introduce the course. But then I'd say come towards the end of year nine and throughout year 10, students have the chance to work um, on the practical, I would say kind of 60 to 80 percent of the time. But alongside this, I'll often find that they they do a little bit more of the written aspect of the of the course at home as part of their homework. Lovely. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, Miss Overton, I'm going to come to you because we've had a really good question from Kashita in the chat. Uh, what's the difference between art and well, fine art and art textiles? What is the difference? Yeah. Um, fine art are really the traditional art, so it's drawing, painting, printmaking, sculpture, but it can also be film installation. It can have sound. I think the difference really is uh, in the purpose of it and the outcome. So it, it doesn't have to have a function. It doesn't have to be from design. It doesn't have to be a costume. It doesn't have to be a vase. Um, it's art for art's sake, essentially, and it can be quite challenging. Uh, it can be quite political. Um, it's art for art's sake, really. Uh, whereas, yeah, uh, textiles is more materials and fabrics and, and making that, and design is, um, is, is making things, products. Well, actually, just to add to that, we do also do a lot of conceptual art in our textiles. So yeah. students do. We do we do encourage students to try out um, lots of different aspects. So they do make products, but also they do do kind of pure art, but it has a textile outcome. And I think the point that I would make is maybe towards the end of year 10 and year 11, when students are starting their personal projects, it's up to them on the outcome that they do. We're not specific. We don't dictate that you have to make a product. We allow them to make that choice, whether it is going to be more an art or a, a product. So there's, yeah. there's no ownership over them at the end of year 10 and, and year 11 personal yeah. projects. And if I just say there are crossovers in fine art as well. Yeah. So if they're really interested in doing something that's very textile based or something to do with a the costume, then they, ca they can do that yeah. in the fine art. Cool. Lovely. Um, I think Mr. Newman's just cut out, but I think uh, Miss Daly, you do have a knowledge on design and technology as well. So I am going to ask yeah. you this question. Um, what, uh, what will you study in design and technology? So in design and technology, again, it's a, it's a very creative course. And I think um, what we're very much um, interested in is that the students certainly outside school as well as inside school have a real genuine interest in kind of all things design and making. So what we kind of say is that we're looking for students to have a genuine interest in the manufacture of products um, and students learn about a range of designers and how to assemble products as part of the DT course. Um, 
Yes, and certainly, like we would expect students to complement the work at school by engaging with reading, um, looking at design, and visiting exhibitions outside school. Fantastic. Sorry, Mr. Newman, I just asked a design technology question. Yeah, that's, that's fine. Um, my my Wi Fi has just dropped out. It's going to be one of those days today. Joys no, of remote teaching. No problem. I'll, I'll ask you another design technology question. Sure. Um, where can design technology take you in the future? Okay, so design technology, obviously, a really hands on practical uh, subject. So, uh, and that can take you into two different routes. It can take you down the route of sort of industrial design. So, people who want to go and design um, items, for example, things around the home, industrial type design like that. It could take you down the route of engineering or architecture as well for students who are interested in that element. But you can also do the hands on approach as well or mix and match the both. So, people who are interested in perhaps craft type skills so woodwork or construction theater set design things like that so there's a, a wide range of things that you can do uh, with design technology and where it can take you brilliant lovely thank you very much mr newman uh, miss overton um what are the benefits to art so that's a tough question no well essentially it broadens your mind it helps you kind of notice things uh think about and respond to the world around you really it, it helps you express yourself it's quite therapeutic and relaxing um, but at the same time, it allows you to explore your own interests in, a, in quite a deep way. So it's, yes, it's really creative, but it's it's more than that. Okay, cool, lovely. Um, that's great, thank you. So Miss Daly, um, this is a really good question. What attributes uh, is it important for my son or daughter to have in order to be able to succeed within art textiles? Um, I would say, and I, I, I imagine that I'm talking for all of us here when I say that it's really important that your child has a genuine interest in the subject area. It's certainly not an easy option. In fact, actually, there's a lot of rigour in, in all three of these subjects, and it's quite demanding in, time, in terms of your time. Um, although we suggest a key stage four that all students need to do in our homework at GCSE, I certainly know that the students that perform best in my subject um, do above and beyond this. So time management is um, time management is actually incredibly important organization because actually we don't often lessons lead one lesson leads into the next lesson and homework leads into the following lesson so students have to be really really organized and actually also they probably need to be really well equipped at home it doesn't matter that you need to spend you don't necessarily need to spend loads of money but you do need some of the basics and to be able to work on your on your work at home as well okay Cool, lovely. Thank you very much. And um, Miss o uh, Miss Overton, uh, would fine arts rule out architecture at a later point? Really good question. No, actually, it's it's a really good one. Um, for architecture, you need maths and you need physics and um, an understanding of uh, sort of computer graphics, three D modelling on computers. But actually, they do like art, and um, often architectural practices will send their uh, people out to learn how to draw freehand. Um, my niece did GCSE art and A-level fine art, and she went on to do a degree in architecture as well. Great, cool. Thank you very much. And I'm going. This is a general question that's just come in um, to uh, for, for all the subjects. Um, what will I need in preparation? I I'll ask Mr. Uh, I'll ask Mr. Newman actually first, and then you guys can jump in. Uh, what will I need? Uh, will I need to buy anything before? And if so, is there any financial support available for anything that I need? Okay, so uh, yeah, I think this is probably the same for all of the, the practical subjects. Um, there will be an expectation for students to uh, have kind of the bare minimum at their fingertips so that they can, uh, it, particularly when you're doing your home learning, you've got access to all the materials you need to, to produce the best possible work. Um, for us in DT, that would include things like colored pencils, fine liners, uh, some basic kind of drawing equipment, um, but the expenditure is not going to be terribly high and we can certainly um, direct you on the sorts of things and the resources that you should need to buy at the start of your journey in year nine and I suspect the other um, subjects will do that as well. But certainly the expenditure is not overly high and there is uh, support available through the school on what to direct you to buy and perhaps provision of some of those materials as well. So I certainly wouldn't see, uh, you know, just because it's a practical subject, the expenditure is, is really not 
considerably great. The only thing that probably is worth saying, particularly for, for my discipline is design technology, is that um, if you are going to make a final outcome, so that might be, for example, a storage device or a lamp or some sort of project like that, any materials that students do use, um, any fixtures and fittings like lamps, bulbs or anything like that, obviously the students do need to pay for those consumables. Um, that isn't funded through the school but again there is support about for that so for did certainly tea uh, the materials that we use metals woods plastic they do have to be covered by the students so that is an expectation but again the cost of that through spread out across the whole of the year is, is really not a particularly significant amount lovely and is that the same for for fine arts miss overton yeah um everything in class is paid for so paper paint um printing materials clay all of that is is paid for but we do expect students they need to be working at home painting and they need to have sketchbooks uh, and they do need to buy those um we do do art packs that are up to 30 pounds that provide a kind of starter kit that usually lasts the entire three years um but again there might be added expenses if they want to buy particular canvases uh, they they may have to purchase that as well. Um, again, there there is some support, uh, some financial support for these art packs as well. Um, and they might find if they've bought a little pack in uh, from year seven and eight, um, that's got some of the basics. So they might just need to top up with with just the acrylic paints and some new brushes, that kind of thing. Mm. Thank you very much. And uh, there was another question on the Google form for art textiles. How much group work is involved? Um, well, at the minute, no group work, really, but um, we do. So we have in the past had some projects where students collaborate on um, projects together. And um, we've also had some collaboration in line with artists as well that come into the, to the school and work with students. And um, so there is an element of that. However, once it kind of comes to year 10, because all the GCSE work um, goes towards the students' final marks of GCSE, much of the work is kind of independent on their own but certainly that is something that we do in year nine can I just ask one and answer to one of the questions of the chat as well about art helping in medicine um oh sorry actually maybe Miss Overton wants to talk about that <laughs> I was going to say across the subject, and um, there's actually loads of evidence. In Harvard, they actually ask students to do a module in art because, um, with all these subjects, it's really some really valuable fine motor skills that are essential for things like veterinary and surgery and for medicine. And um, so, you know, art is a, is a great complement to some of those more academic subjects, and actually has very much uh, quite a few transferable skills that can be used across different um, different different careers in the future. Yeah, I, I definitely echo that. I've, I've come across lots of um, uh, workshops and things that are involved with medical school and students yeah. where they're, they're wanting them to, so they can diagnose things with their, you know, with their fingers. So they want them to sculpt and they want them to life draw. And you only have to look at Leonardo da Vinci to see the link between art and, and science. Yeah. I, I'm just going to come in here. I want to say thank you so much to the hard subject leads for the uh, for the creative subjects for art, art textiles, and Mr. Newell for design technology. Thank you so much. And I think it's a really interesting point that's been made regarding medicine and the link with creative subjects. These subjects like medicine and veterinary sciences and architecture are highly competitive. And actually what universities really want is, a, is someone who's got a very broad range of GCSEs. And I highly recommend to students to do something creative um, with their options choices as well uh, to balance it out so they get that full spectrum of subjects for the next three years as well. So thank you very much, all of you. Enjoy the rest of your evenings. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you, guys. Good luck. Thank you. And just while we're waiting for a couple of the other uh, heads of department to come in for the next block, um, just a couple of general questions that have come through. One, I noticed someone was asking about some what support is available for my child in making decisions. Yes, we are aware that this is quite early in terms of it being year eight rather than year nine. Um, that hasn't been a problem in the past. I still don't think it's a problem now. Um, but obviously, some students might be feeling a little bit more concerned because they've, they, they've missed a bit of schooling. Please do not worry. Obviously, what's the best thing and the best news we've had is that students are going to be back in school next week, which means actually their time will be spent having face to face support and advice. And I think that's really, really important that they can actually speak to their form tutors. 
they can find Mr. Wallace and sit there and speak to him. They can find, I'll be around as well. I'll spend quite a bit of time over the year eight zone over the next few weeks as well so that people can come to me at break and lunchtime and ask me questions. I've gone through this process for the last four or five years with students. And whilst there's always some nervousness around it, because they can change their minds up until Christmas, I don't envisage it being a problem. So it's, you know, that support is available. There will also be the support in terms of careers advice. And we they're so lucky in year eight that they're in the Betcham and they've got Mrs. Wilkes available, um, who's our resident careers expert as well. And she'll be able to point people in advice of websites and resources to what do you want to do later on and what's best for you to choose now for that. Again, there's a little uh, page on the GCSE options website, which I highly recommend you look at if you are finding that different. But best thing to do come and find one of us when we're back in school next week and speak to us about it and we'll be able to help you with what to do um and because it is some big choices but it's an exciting choice as well i think to make and i'm just going to welcome in now miss potter for dance and miss townsend for drama um i think we've got one more uh, and Mrs. Turnbull here as well for music. So our more, uh, shall we say, practical creative subjects where the bit of performance is involved and they'll be able to answer your questions. I think one thing that perhaps these have in common with the previous subjects is that balance to perhaps some of the other academic subjects like history, geography and MFL that we've already talked about. And having that broad and balanced curriculum is is really um, important. And I can see someone's actually said that they're not interested in the arts. There are other options that perhaps are within that, perhaps media studies, perhaps computer science might be an option or PE as well. Um, in terms of materials, please do not worry if you think, please do not choose a subject because, or don't choose a subject because you think you couldn't afford the materials for that. Um, that will be supported by the school. We know that sometimes there are financial difficulties and in the current climate, that could be a problem for some families. Um, we would not want that to stop a child from doing the subject and there will be support always available for that. I appreciate it's a very sensitive subject. So you do feel free to just email either the tutor or feel free to email myself if that's something you wish to discuss personally. And I'm gonna hand over to Mr. Wallace and the heads of drama, dance and music. Thank you very much. Hi guys, how are we doing? Hey, how are you? <laughs> very well, thanks, very well. Thank you for joining us. And um, we've had some questions come in the chat, uh, RE Music. So Ms. Turnbull, I'll come to you straight away. Um, yeah. it, well, I'll answer the first one. Is music a GCA, GCSE option? Yes, yes it is. Uh, and the question for you is, how is the music GCSE weighed between theoretical study and practice? So practical. Okay, so the, um, there's a performance part of the GCSE, which is weighted at 30%. And this makes up of two performances. One is a solo piece and one is an ensemble piece. So working as a group, which is something we do throughout the course. So the students get used to doing it, even if they've never done it before. And the second part is composition, which again is another um, 30%. Um, and they make two compositions, one of their free choice, so they can compose it on absolutely any style of music. And the second one is set by the exam board, so we'll be given a set brief, which is linked to a study, um, an area of music that we study. And then the final bit is 40%, uh, which is the analysis, so listening and analysing music. And there are eight set works that we study in detail, and then we learn how to actually um, listen to them and um, de decipher all the different features and the musical terminology and do a bit of essay writing on it for a 12 mark question at the end of it so that's 40 percent but the way we teach it is it's integral so which if we're learning for example we might be learning a bit about killer queen but then we'll also learn some um, practical pieces of music um, that are linked into that killer queen some performance pieces of music a bit comp composing so all of the three strands are taught together so they get a full understanding of how all the different um, different aspects of music are interrelated Fantastic. Thank you very much. That's, that's brilliant. Thank you very much for the detail. Um, uh, Miss Townsend, I'm going to come to you. Is drama all about the set text or is there some flexibility for some of the work to be done on plays the children find more to their taste? Yeah, there's definite flexibility. Um, we study one set text, which is a given, which is Blood Brothers, but that's only 20 percent of the course uh, for the written exam. Um, and we do the Crucible in year nine and 
regarding performing text and scripts, there's loads of choice and the students have a lot of input there. You know, I put a big pile on the floor and we'll have a look through, I'll recommend ones. So there's lots of flexibility for them to explore and to perform for their component three, which is the performance exam where they have to um, perform two extracts from a play. And, you know, I, I spend a long time talking to them, trying to cast them correctly, because that's half the battle, getting the right play that interests them, the right characters, etc. So there's a lot of different scope throughout the three years of looking at all sorts of different texts and genres. And I, I really recommend that, that that's the, the best for their best interest to have a breadth of um, different types of texts and genres. Awesome. Lovely. Thank you very much. That's that's great. Thank you very much. So uh, this question is for dance and it was from the Google form. Um, where can dance take my son or daughter in the future and what courses does it lend itself to? Um, so in terms of future careers, um, obviously, Exhibit A is teaching. So um, I actually uh, did PE and dance on the side at university. So that took me through, obviously, to my teaching degree. So you can be a dance teacher, you can be a performer, you can get into TV, um, you can do um, all sorts of things with, within theatre, so whether that be actually on stage, um, but just actually learning about dance and how it works in terms of like a show, um, then you can do a variety of different sort of job roles within a theatre pathway. Um, Obviously, it's a very creative subject, um, so it does a lot of the choreography side of things. So you might end up being a choreographer. You might end up really, really enjoying that side of things and might end up choreographing for certain performances in terms of professional works and things like that. Um, in terms of how you can get there in the future for the college side of things, which would be next after school, um, we have there's performing arts um courses that would be more of a BTEC side of things or you could do a level dance um I did a level dance alongside BTEC sports so it's quite full-on at college but I knew I wanted to do both but that is sort of a way you can get around it if you sort of can't decide and you like lots of other varieties a level would be the way to go if you really love dance and maybe also music and drama within it as well performing arts is a perfect course for you in college and then moving forward to university, you would have dance on its own, um, or again, it could be performing arts. So there's a variety of different pathways, but it's a really good creative subject to have under your wing. Lovely, thank you very much, Miss Potter, that's great. Uh, Miss Tambor, I'm gonna come to you. What, this is from the chat. Uh, what type of music do you study in music, or do you do different genres in different topics? Okay, so we the four set areas of music we look at is instrumental music. And so we look at, um, at the moment, we're studying a piece of Bach and a piece of Beethoven. Then we look at vocal music. At the moment, we're doing a uh, Purcell and um, Killer Queen um, by Queen. And then um, we look at music from stage and screen. So at the moment, uh, we're looking at Wicked and we um, there is also um, the Star Wars main theme. And we also do some fusion. So we do some afro, afro sound system and um, some sample music as well so they are set work so they completely cover all the different genres and then when we're studying each set work we will look at lots of different musics that are from those same genres as well so you you know if we're studying the um purcell which is a ground bass piece we'll listen to other pieces by um traditional rock composers but also um we might listen to something that, like Ellie Golding, because she also uses ground bass in some of her music. So we'll be looking at lots and lots of different genres. And I also noticed that he said about music technology, we're not offering music technology as a separate GCSE, but we do use music technology within it, uh, within music um, GCSE, because we'll be doing comp composition. So we're um, doing a lot more work on Band Lab at the moment. We also have the MIDI suite, which has Logic Pro. Um, so we do use music technology when we're doing the composition, but it's not a standalone GCSE. Thank you very much. That's great. Awesome. So, Miss Townsend, this was one from uh, the Google form. Uh, what are the benefits to my son or daughter uh, studying drama? Lots of benefits. <laughs> Why wouldn't you want to? Um, I think like three main strands I've identified. So the benefits are the kind of skills that you get, it's kind of academic skills. So improve your written skills. It, it kind of 
complements English a lot um, and we're quite similar in some ways but we have a very different distinct drama style of writing um, so academically it's just really enjoyable being able to explore text characters and also think about it practically and that is the big difference that when we're looking at text and things like that it's all about how you'd perform a role might how you might stage something etc but also lots of social skills as well and communication skills and performance skills so um, performance wise um, you'd learn so much different genres different practitioners we study like Brecht for example Stanislavski um, different theatre techniques the art of trying to engage your audience how do you keep them there and captivate them um, um, how do you, you know, use all different sorts of styles of theatre um, throughout history and ages and also their social side as well so that you know the key thing is the social skills so teamwork skills students learning to work together and negotiate that's the sort of life skills that you really kind of carry on and through and the employers are really keen on as well because drama students often have good presentation skills they're used to having to negotiate and to listen to each other and communicate and groups go through real journeys it's, it's like it's amazing to see but the journey of creating a piece of theatre for one of the units for example they have to uh, work together and come up with their own story and they're not working from script at all and it's a real journey and it's a real challenge for them to create something that's really decent and, and using all their skills, but they have really good days and they, they hit walls sometimes and they have to kind of work through that together. I think that's really vital. That's lovely. That's great. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to ask Miss Potter some questions from the forum and then we'll uh, answer the questions from the chat, Miss Tom. Uh, so Miss Potter, do I have to have done a uh, dance before? And this next question, which sort of links to it, do we need to buy anything in preparation for dance? Okay, so you definitely do not need to have done any dance background previously. So I don't expect you to come in and be like a level five in ballet. Like that's not not what is would be expected of you. You don't even need to have had done a dance class previously. Um, I've got some of our year 10 students that haven't done any dance beforehand um, and they're, you know, brilliant. I mean, it obviously is going to help if you have rhythm. So, you know, if you can have rhythm and pick up and can dance to some music, then that is just probably going to be your starting point. And that's absolutely fine coming into it like that. But you definitely do not need a dance background or to have been trained in anything specifically. Um, and the other question was the needing anything beforehand. Um, Basically, we do have a dance kit, which um, sort of gradually pretty much every stu dance student should have. Um, it would be great to get it before you start. Um, it's generally black leggings and a black T-shirt. And you can get both of those from Link Up. And it's the FHS black leggings and FHS dance T-shirt, which just says GCC dance on it, has a dance picture on the back and you can get your initials on it. But if you can't get that straight away, it wouldn't be a problem at all. OK, but it would be just if you can't get it, plain black leggings, plain black T-shirt and hopefully we'll all eventually be in the same um, kit as it is a new subject. We're sort of still rolling that through. Brilliant. Thank you very much. That's great. And Miss Turnbull, a couple more music ones. So for music, do students have to be a certain level with an instrument or could they be beginners? So you, you can be a beginner, um, but you do have to be learning an instrument. OK, so it doesn't matter if you're only just starting now. That's not a problem. Uh, we do cover sort of how to read music as well within it, within um, the, the course. Um, but you will need to carry on lessons throughout the course of the um, the, the GCSE. So over the three years, as I said earlier, it's 30 percent of the final mark. So obviously you want to be as best musician as you possibly can by the time you do that to get the best opportunity to get a good grade. So, yes, you can be a beginner, but you do need to make sure you do have an instrument. Um, and another one's about singing. We do singing music all the time uh, because we all have an instrument there and this is our voice. So we will sing all the time. I'm never going to make anyone stand up and do a solo unless they really want to. But we use our voices just as a musical instrument. Um, but we also you bring in your own instruments as well and when we're doing performing if you're a guitarist you'd bring your guitar in okay but we do you still use our voices okay, okay brilliant. brilliant thank you so much to our heads of dance drama and music and i'd like to say very much thank you very much to them for taking part this evening and for the questions and i'm going to let them go now so thank you very much goodbye thanks <laughs> Wait to bring in the next uh, heads and subject leads, which are our 
uh, heads of computing and subject for enterprise and also for statistics as well. Um, just a couple of quest general questions I will bring in uh, whilst we're waiting for them all to arrive. Um, the first one was about how many GCSEs do we do you take? So every student will take four options um, and they get a free choice within that. And then when we, I put the blocks together, we work out does that combination all work together? And I've been very, very lucky to say that actually in the last few years, everybody's got their options, choices. So that's a really good thing. And then someone else asked about mixed sides of the year. You definitely get your sides of the year mixed up. We want you to uh, develop as different people, meet new people. So we mix everything up and options are completely mixed up. Um, I'm going to welcome the heads of um Computing as Mr. Bates, Mrs. Snedden for Enterprise, and Mr. Code for Statistics. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. And Good evening. we have uh, got a couple of questions to begin with that have come in prior to this evening through the Google Forms. Uh, the first one is for statistics, and the student would like to know, Mr. Code, what is statistics? Well, that's a that's a great and a very broad question. And um <laughs> I'll make sure I answer it as quick as I can. So really what we're thinking about with statistics is it's all about collecting, analyzing and interpreting information. A lot of the forms of information um, can be numerical, but basically if it involves data and it involves information, then uh, that's what statistics is all about. Thank you very much, Mr. Code. And Mr. Bay as well, which what would students be studying in computing? Could you explain about the course a little bit more? Yeah, sure. So um, the computing is is different to perhaps the choices that we we had when we were doing uh, our GCSEs, which was mostly to do with IT. So we don't really learn to use computers like we don't learn to use Microsoft Office or or um, you know Microsoft Word. We we actually learn about how uh, computers themselves work. And what I've done to kind of help the year eights understand the difference there. Uh, the last unit that they've been doing so for the last six weeks they've actually been doing quite sneakily some of the gcse curriculum already uh, so that was binary conversion and sort of understanding how computers can manipulate numbers so um, they've already got a little bit of a taster of what the difference is there and of course there's lots of programming as well learning how to how to write programs to fit specific problems so we get like a, a slight problem and we try and think about a solution using code on how we can actually computationally solve that that problem. Thank you very much. Uh, Mrs. Snedden, could you explain whether Enterprise covers both level one and level two for the BTEX for us and how perhaps a little bit about how the grading works for Enterprise as well? Yep, so we do cover the level one and level two because they're quite closely linked. Um, so we always start with the level one, and that's the sort of basics, identifying and outlining the material. Um, and it's still the same topics that we cover for both the level one and level two. But um, I aim to get all of the students up to the level two because that's the GCSE standard. So we look to do the pass level two, the merit level two, and the distinction level two criteria by the um, year 10 and year 11 when they're doing their assessments. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Coe, could you talk to us a little bit about what careers perhaps statistics would be useful for? Yes, well, absolutely. Um, I mean, effectively, any sub, uh, any career or be it college course where information needs to be analysed, it's, it's going to be valuable. Um, so it could be certainly, um, for example, within a psychology course, a lot of there will be a lot of data in terms of behavior statistics and things like that certainly within sports science and um the analysis of performance data that's going to be crucial so it really is as broad as it is long so for example many um college courses will have a unit called quantitative methods and that could be from geography as i say to uh sport and so on so really you can safely say that statistics is useful in any, um, really in any job and anywhere. If it involves um, data, then um, statistics is used, most definitely. Thank you very much. And Mrs. Nan, could you talk to people about what exactly enterprise is and what they learn in enterprise as well, please? Yep, definitely. So enterprise is sort of what we would call business studies. So when I studied it at school, it was business studies. 
but the the enterprise part is um, bringing it more to life. So we look at local businesses. Um, so the local businesses that we have in our local area, and sometimes, obviously not this year, but we get the local business entrepreneurs to come in, so the business owners to come in and talk to um, the students in the classes. And we have assessments that are written about the, the businesses themselves in terms of the people who run them, so the characteristics and skills that they have, um, the market research that they carry out, and then looking at all the internal and external factors that affect those businesses. So obviously, um, at the moment, the current year 10s are looking at the effects that COVID are having on the two local businesses they've chosen to write about. Um, and then additionally to that, we look at business planning. So how to set up a business um, and the students have to actually come up with a business idea and fully plan it, carry out the market research and then do a pitch in terms of a Dragon's Den style pitch. And then the final part would be the exam part where we learn all about promoting and marketing. So looking at all the different ways that you can promote your business and finance. So we cover a lot of life skills within that as well, because we do look at all the different methods of payment. So we do consider credit cards and interest rates, um, but also budgeting as well. So it's all about accountants in, in that part as well. Thank you very much, Mrs. Sneddon. Uh, Mr. Bate, perhaps you could answer for us if there's any requ uh, additional equipment required for computer. I should clarify that computing and computer science are the same subject. We call it in school computing, but the actual GCSE is computer science. So I'll use the proper word from now on. So for computer science, do students need anything other than their Chromebooks? Uh, no. So all of the tools that we use are freely available. And I'm quite a uh... I quite I believe in using free tools anyway for uh, so 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 the, the skills that students will learn um, even if they don't want to continue on with a future career they can actually use those skills later on for a different career path perhaps so all the tools that we use all of the um, equipment that we use is free online and um, and uh, that's the way I quite like it so it so students will be able to access the the websites and the, and the actual tools um on in their chromebooks or if they've got a home pc as well they could actually log into there and continue the work as well so yeah um there's a question that's come into the chat about the difference between ict and computer science and whereas there's no difference between computing and computer science there is quite a big difference between that those two subjects could you explain that please yeah of course so ict is uh, the old name for the subject that would use computers which would be more about how to use um, like office packages and how to use computers in a business setting. Um, so you imagine how you're using like computers within within your office, you know, you're doing emails, you're doing, um, doing documents, you're doing Excel sheets, things like that. And we no longer actually teach that in uh, Farnham Heath End School at all. Uh, we, do, we do perhaps a little bit of that integrated with other subjects. Um, so we, our, our, our actual computer, based subject, specialist subject, is now computing or computer science at GCSE level, which is um, much more about how computers actually work and um, programming. It's kind of like the way, I, the, the way I can simply put it is that um, ICT was like reading and computing is like writing. So you're actually writing programs and applications rather than just using something that someone else has, has created. And for Mr. Code, why should a student choose statistics? What are they going to get out of it? What would be the big benefits for that? Um, so really, statistics is, um, I mean, effectively, the important thing to remember is statistics, it, it, is, a, it, is, a full, um, it is a full GCSE. Um, I think certainly it's very valuable um, for, as I said to you earlier, about sort of analysing data. And one comment that was quite interesting I saw earlier in the chat was around lies, damn lies and statistics. So one thing it will do is it will really help the <laughs> students for their skills and in inquiry. So thinking about bias, um, thinking about the fact that the information we are interpreting is absolutely accurate. So mathematically, it will be, um, it is a fully inclusive GCSE. And the way that we will run it will really help all, all sort of levels of mathematics, but it can be a really useful help to bridge the gap, uh, say, for example, between uh, GCSE and A-level maths, which we know is quite a notorious gap. Um, 
in terms of it, I'll, I'll, I'll sort of stress what I said before. Many, many subjects and in really whatever level of study you have will actually involve quantitative methods. And it really does give the students a, um, a, a real advantage and a head start when it comes to analyzing data and, and writing inquiries, following an inquiry cycle when it goes beyond. And I would say, really, the key thing is we only look, need to look at how data rich the news and media is at the moment to realize that these skills are so transferable and so important. Thank you very much. And Mrs. Sneddon, is the Enterprise BTEC considered a full GCSE? Yes, that's why we do the level two and we've chosen the tech award so that it, it's one of the new um, sort of harder and uh, BTECs of the group. So, yes, it is. Thank you. And Mr. Bay, final question to you. What can you do with computing after GCSE? Uh, so for, for a lot of the students that do pick computing, they're considering using uh, technology and using computers as a further career path. Um, it doesn't mean that it doesn't mean that you have to necessarily I think all the GCSEs no, no picking any GCSE isn't going to prevent you from going into any career path. Um, that's, that's very important to, to state. Um, likewise, you can definitely have a future career in computer science without doing the GCSE. So it's not, you know, it doesn't cut you off from from uh, any future future sort of decision. But I think, you know, every every single industry, every single uh, job and particularly any, every profession has been touched by computing and computers in some way. And for some of it, it's completely revolutionized the industry. And for others, um, it's starting to do that. And and we're getting more and more instances of 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 um, of sort of jobs and job roles being changed and and being perhaps sometimes even made redundant because now computers are so invested in that industry. So it's it's um, it's a huge growth market for jobs. I think it's one of the biggest even even still now it's one of the biggest areas where where jobs are are in need and there's it's never really been filled um, uh, with you know the amount of, of of graduates that's coming out of university is just never enough. So there's huge potential in cybersecurity, in um, in entrepreneurship, um, either working for someone else, working for yourself. You know, it's it's a really, really is a kind of foundation of our, our modern society. Um, there you go. <laughs> Brilliant. I'd like to take this chance to say thank you very much to Mrs. Snedden, uh, to Mr. Code, and to Mr. Bate as well. Thank you for joining us this evening and thank you to everyone for your questions. Um, obviously, you may go now and enjoy your evening and then we will welcome the next set of uh, subject leaders in. So thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. you. Have a good evening. Bye. Bye. Uh, there's a question that came through in the chat just at the end there around would enterprise BTEC be useful for uh, a lawyer? Um, and in understanding how business works, Yes, definitely, depending on what kind of law you want to go into. Um, my hesitancy would be around how you access law and how you then go into law. There are different routes into law. The main um, uh, aspect of going into law would be through university. And again, it's a highly competitive course with quite specific requirements for subjects. I really recommend looking on our careers website, on the GCSE options website, looking for law and looking at what they want. I do know that history is definitely, if you want to be a lawyer, history is highly recommended because of your ability to understand evidence and interpret evidence and write critically. And su the surprising one for law is always drama. Um, it's your ability to stand up and speak confidently in front of people as well. And I think that that is something to really bear in mind that perhaps some subjects you wouldn't automatically think for certain careers have very transferable skills that could lend themselves to, to that very, very nicely. Whilst I'm just waiting for our next set of subject leaders to attend, so we've got, um, I believe it's, uh, we've got Mrs. Code, who's going to talk to us about media and film studies, uh, Miss Bibby for RE, and then Mr. Latusk for uh, citizenship. Just want to cover a few more of the general questions um, that have come up. Um, and sort of those, again, are around support. Um, and again, I can only reiterate that your support will be provided by the tutor, um, by Mr. Wallace, by myself, by Mrs. Wilkes. We really recommend that you uh, visit the options website as well and use the links that are on there for careers 
to help you uh, develop that one as well. Mr. Wallace, are there any questions from earlier on from the Google form that haven't yet been covered? Uh, yeah, there was a really good one actually on the Google form, which we, which I was hoping we'd have time for. Um, yeah. How can my son or daughter get put into their classes? So in terms of, I've talked about the big mixing that happens, um, which is always really exciting that they get to be with new people. So for options, what happens is, uh, it's quite a complicated computer program. We feed in all the children's options and it works out uh, certain models for me to be able to see if the combinations work. And essentially that's how they get put into their option blocks. Um, and we look at that, we make sure there's not two, you know, we make sure that I don't have one class of 30 and one class of 15, for example. So we do spread it out so we get good numbers across all subject areas. Um, it, that's for the option subjects. So it's quite random um, and they will be with completely different people uh, than they would have been in the past. They'll obviously and you'll still know some people, but there is that big mix. For maths, English and science, um, it is... Um, done through um obviously they get banded again and then depending on where they go it will be various sets or mixed ability and that's decided by the head of department and they look at a range of factors um including sort of social mixing and what's best for the young person and what's best for them to be in which class with which teacher as well to some some extent i do really need to reiterate that do not choose a subject because you don't like or do like the teacher you've got in year eight because there's no guarantee you will get that teacher in year nine year 10 or year 11 um and that works both ways so i'm just going to welcome in now uh mr latusk and miss uh, and mrs co uh, i think someone must have you somewhere or there's a, a or there's a, a Thank you. Thank um, you. Um, we'll chair this, we'll this evening. And so I'm going to hand over to you. Yeah, guys, if, if one yeah, of you if one one you open, on, open on, another tab, on another tab, we're on mute because we're getting a bit of feedback. We're getting a bit of feedback. Is that, how's that now? That, how's that now? No, I can't. I haven't got anything else. Okay. Well, okay. We'll, we'll, well, well, you can hear me. And I'm just going to hear me. I'm just going to through. Um, the first question I've got. The first question I've got. Um, um first, 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 studies and what we're studying. Okay. Well, hopefully. Okay. Well, hopefully. And um, just to say that me this Oh God, it is really feedback, isn't it? <laughs> um, oh, but media, yeah. media studies is an in-depth um, study of media products. Um, so such as uh, studying print advertising, maybe film posters, maybe television, um, drama series, um, lots of different products that we um, study. And we study that in terms of the, um, the language used to communicate to an audience, the concept of audience itself, uh, the really um, big concept of representation. So how people are represented and who isn't represented. Um, and also looking at industry. So um, looking at the industries that produce these and the context behind that. So there's historical context, like with English, is a very important part of media studies. Um, it's both an exam subject and one where we do a practical element, a uh, non-examined assessment in which um, students respond to uh, um, various briefs uh, asking them to produce media products and to evaluate them. Hope that helps. That's brilliant. Thank you very much, uh, Mrs. Code. That's awesome. I had, we also had a very similar question about citizenship. Uh, obviously, it's a subject that they haven't studied. So I'll ask the same question, really. What is citizenship uh, and, and what is covered within the course? Sure. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Wallace. Um, can you guys hear me? I'm not sure of what's going on. Oh, with the mic. Now. Yeah, great. Fantastic. Um, so luckily, no tech in citizenship, but um, in uh, for, uh, citizenship can be split very simply into three parts, tripartite for me personally. Um, you have the academic side, which uh, does, as any other humanity, uh, look into concepts, look into um, how the world works around uh, the, uh, us as, as a society, it does uh, look into systems and processes. So, for example, you know, looking at um, 
uh, at the the identity of a citizen with a country, how that government works, and then looking at a sort of like a, a more globalized international um, citizen approach. So you so you have that there. Um, uh, risk of not wanting to go on too long. I'll move on to the next bit. The the, the next bit is uh, citizen. This is the the USP for citizenship for me, um, which which sort of does something that a, another humanities course uh, doesn't necessarily do in, in in the same way. And that's developed skills of oracy. That's developed skills of persuasion and and, and argument building. Um, and actually, in, in in what is becoming such a competitive globalized job market, and in particular, is going to be such a competitive uh, competitive job market in this country. Um, to, to have something where you be a student is able to have the confidence to convey themselves, to convey their their, their point of argument, to to to, to articulate uh, to a high standard what it is that they're trying to 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 get across. I think is going to be very instrumental um, for 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 those candidates that want to go into, and be successful in the job market. Um, uh, as a as as a sort of last part of that tripartite is um active citizenship and again you know you sort of don't really think about humanity b being practical uh but it does have that practical element where you know you're actually able to understand the impact of lobbying of protest of uh you know really uh getting involved with your community whether that is a a, a local council local government or a national government level, um, you'll be given the opp opportunity in citizenship to create a project where you do actually try and exercise your right as a citizen, um, and 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 also sort of exercise your 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 knowledge um, and your your capacity to get involved in the governance around you. And I think that for young people, that's such an important thing in the modern context because now that you know with the world in the way that it is. I think the voice of young people is ever increasingly becoming more and more important. And, and actually, I think that there has been and is still a strong voice and a strong argument for the voting age being lowered to 16. And I think that uh, if uh, more people are picking up subjects like citizenship at an early age, then, you know, it really does qualify the fact that these young people can and should have a voice. And, and I think that uh, anyone who does d d decide to use, uh, decide to choose citizenship at this stage i think will be a pioneer for enacting that kind of change so that, that that's the kind of thing that we can offer in citizenship brilliant thank you very much latouche that's that's fantastic and um, miss bibby uh, a question from the google form and i'm conscious we've got stuff in the chat for film study so we'll come to that in a second um well for re i think it really gives skills of debate um and um how to construct complex answers how to understand other people and their opinions and also be able to understand where you hold your belief in terms of not just you know um religious aspects but we also do philosophy and we do ethics so that's actually looking at all the things that are happening in the world so we look at you know war abortion euthanasia the environment and you know what's our role in society um and how do we understand where other people's beliefs and ethics and morals come from really Fab, that's lovely. Fab. Thank you. That was lovely. Thank you. Great. Right. And um, so right. we do have a couple of questions. Re sort of uh, film studies and media. So I'll come to you, Mrs. Code. The first one is: uh, mm -hmm. Where will film studies AS level take you? Um, well, studying AS film means that obviously um, you're when you go on to the next stage of your education, you are able to illustrate that you um, accelerated into AS at an earlier age. Um, but in terms of film studies, the subject itself, um, ultimately, it can take you to um, a, a film studies um, focus like a degree, for example, uh, because just to stress, if you do AS level, um, then you'd have to, uh, you know, you couldn't just top up with the A2. Um, there's no, stand, it's, it's a standalone uh, qualification. You couldn't top it up. Um, so if you did AS at um, Farnham Heath End School, um, then what you could do is use those points. So if you hopefully got the A where A you to get you could um, bank 20 points to add to your UCAS form uh, in order to apply for say for example a film studies uh, degree and maybe later on a film studies master however also it gives you an understanding to be able to perhaps work in the uh, film marketing uh, film distribution um, film production even um, so a lot of the students are really interested in going to film production and they really enjoy the practical element whereby they learn from makers of film in order to make their own films 
Um, uh, but as I say, there's there's lots of offshoots from um, film studies in terms of the skills that you would learn, for example, research, um, critical um, thinking, uh, that obviously that skill base can take you into different directions. Hopefully that answers that question. Yeah, that, that's great. And we'll, and we'll stay with you, Miss Coe, because we've got a couple yeah. of questions as well. So is film studies covered off in media studies at all? And a similar question above is, well, is social media covered within media studies? Okay, so... So in, in media studies, obviously media studies is, is broad. It covers uh, lots of media forms and film is one of those media forms. The reason it's a separate subject is it's also such a significant um, arts movement and uh, the development of cine literacy means that we can study it in an academic way. Um, in media studies, we cover, uh, we do have a look at film, particularly in year nine, in order to help students gather um, media language terminology. Um, um, but in terms of film studies, specifically in media studies, we look at print texts. Um, so the marketing, um, for example, of the James Bond franchise is key uh, set texts at the moment. Um, and But also having to understand the British Board of Film Classification and the industry as a whole, that's part of the course. In terms of social media, uh, we look at that as a platform uh, by which to engage audiences and by which artists, for example, um, music artists use the platform of social media to promote themselves and their music. So social media is very much covered as a platform uh, by which to deliver various media forms, but also as a way of audience engaging with the texts around them. So we know that a lot of people watch um, a, a something on the television, for example, and use social media to interact and have a social interaction with people at the same time. Uh, so that's a very important part of the theoretical audience base that we have to study. Hopefully, again, that answers the question. Lovely. Thank you very much, Mrs. Code. Um, Mr. Latouche, a question in from the Google form. Um, what career does uh, citizenship lend itself to? That's a fantastic question. And one I'm always pleased to answer because um, it's one of those gateway uh, subjects. And I'm not trying to make that sound like a cop out at all because it's not. Um, look, I mean, I, I used to work previously to education. I used to work with um, uh, blue chip clients in the city. And uh, I used to work with directors for uh, in a headhunting role. And um, what these guys always asked me is they wanted people, yes, that could show that they had letters or now numbers on a on, on, a, on a document. Um, and yeah, you know, they, they sort of had these paper qualifications, as it were. But citizenship is one of these qualifications that gives you the skills that will uh, be very uh, attractive to any sort of employer. Now, in, in terms of, you know, the immediacy of what this qualification can sort of lead you on to, uh, it is obviously, you know, going into politics or whatever level. Uh, but it is also very, very, very good for uh, uh, going into things like journalism, which I'm sure Mr. Code, Mrs. Code will back up. Um, and um, it is very good as well for going into a number of areas. And the reason why is because it is one of those subjects that because it develops your your, your, your writing, your, your persuasive writing and, 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 and using higher term vocabulary, uh, because it develops your skills of oracy um, and, uh, and because it kind of gets you to think critically, that, that critical thinking, thinking outside of the box is so attractive to uh to to employers because actually it is a uh, it is a is a problem solving way of thinking so you know when you produce when, when you're confronted in 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 the modern uh job market with a problem you need to be able to solve it uh, and and the the wider you can think and 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 the more scenarios that you can sort of um come up with in terms of solutions um, that is going to be very attractive to to any employer now uh, also you you might be thinking as a question well how does a prospective employer that's not involved in that area know that those skills come from that qualification well they they're, they're very clear on that uh, they're very clear on 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 uh, politics and and citizenship being that basis that you know really develops those skills so actually when uh, when employers are looking at CVs um, you know, it can be so difficult to, to, to turn that CV application into a face to face meeting. And, and actually, it's really sad about how much talent is lost because of the dismissal of 
uh, paper CVs in the modern market. I, I noticed that myself even back in the day when I was there, and I'm sure that the uh, that the situation with time and candidates is, is is not changed in that respect. So to have something that piques the interest of employer that could be the the the, the, the make or break between sitting down and having that face to face opportunity is a subject like citizenship and 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 uh, and hopefully you don't think I'm sort of being too outlandish by making that sort of claim but um that for me that's just the way that I that I see things at the moment with that so um it is it is one of those things and the other thing just the last caveat I'll put on top of that is because of the practical application uh, that we have in citizenship where you sort of do actually go and practice your academics that vocational side of things uh, again is a very very attractive um, uh, prospect to, to a potential employer because you've actually put your learning into practice you've done it on the ground so if you are going to go and be a speech writer for the Labour Party or for the Conservative Party or for whichever party is going at that time you know you, you, you've you sort of got a you've got an initial background and, and you're ahead of your candidates uh, or your fellow candidates or your fellow competitors for that role because you've 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 done that on on the ground you have that sort of a, a bit of a head start over the others so i think as well that, that having the vocational side of citizenship and having that practical element um really does sort of show you can showcase to your employer that you not only have you written about it uh, but you've applied that knowledge as well and i think that's uh, fundamental in, the, in, in in what's to come in the modern job market thank you very much mr Deuce. that's that's fantastic well i'll, I'll ask one more question for miss uh, miss bibby uh, and it's around um it's around ari a question from the google form you mentioned that you cover philosophy a question from the google form was what religion do you study specifically at GCSE in ari okay so we do two uh, religions in depth we do buddhism and christianity as our two main religions <clears throat> um but the other sections the other theme topics are covered from uh, various different religions that we look at when the themes when we talk about abortion euthanasia all of those are covered from different religious aspects as well as ethical moral um, aspects as well not just from buddhism and christianity but those are our two main faiths that we do at gcse lovely that's great thank you very much now there she is very good <laughs> right, as i said say thank you very much to miss bibby miss is code and mr latusk thank you for joining us this evening um i do hope that answered all your questions regarding citizenship media film and um re as well and we're just waiting now to welcome the the next group of subject leaders and that will be for sports science both cambridge national and uh the gcse uh, for psychology and for food and nutrition as well. Um, whilst I'm welcoming them, them in, a reminder as well that again with food, obviously they will be required to make food. That's definitely a requirement of that course. Again, please do not be put off by the fact that you may need to buy your son or daughter um, ingredients for that. And again, if that is a problem, do feel free to email me confidentially and I'll look at what support is available for you um, to support you with that. So I'm going to welcome in now Mr. Ryder as head of uh, PE, uh, Miss Lewis, subject lead for food and nutrition, and Miss Perkis, who runs psychology for us as well. Good evening, everyone. Good, Good evening. evening. Hi, guys. Cool, lovely. Hi. We've got we've got tons of questions uh, for you guys, so we're gonna we're gonna crack straight into it. The first one is from the Google form uh, around psychology. Uh, the first question for you, Miss Perkis, is what is psychology and what do you do in the GCSE? Okay, so psychology is the stud the scientific study of human behaviour. So it obviously is a new course to the students at Farnham Heath End. They don't have any kind of got no back basis or background knowledge to psychology. And um, through the course, we look at various aspects of human behaviour, look at theories that psychologists have come up for those um, human behaviours and then look at the evidence that backs up those theories through the studies that psychologists have carried out. In particular we do um, look at memory and why we remember things and how we remember things which does help ex it helps the students to give a real explanation of why we do our knowledge organisers and the way that we set our homework because they learn about the theory behind that and it's not just the teachers saying this and Mr Marsh saying this is the way you should do it they can actually look at the scientific evidence for that we look at perception and how we see and perceive things how people develop and then um, a big topic looking at social influence and why people follow rules uh, why do they conform why are people obedient 
and then there are crossover links with separate science GCSE biology where we look at the the brain and the neuropsychology and that's kind of like my my specialist area because I did a degree in psychology and neuroscience so looking at the science of the brain yeah that's lovely so <laughs> thank you very much thank you very much Ms. Burkes. that's great I'm going to jump over to uh food and nutrition so Miss Lua uh, a question we had on the google form is um uh, is how much of it is practical and involves cooking? How much of the course? Okay, well, at the moment, that is very much depends upon our current situation. Um, bearing in mind how things are at, at the moment, we've just made the decision to go once a fortnight. Um, if I think back to early last year, the year nines were cooking almost every week. Um, but there is also quite a lot of theory that's involved. So actually, I, th I think spacing out a little bit more isn't a bad thing because that means we can incorporate the theory and the practical together, um, which means that by the end of year 10, the plan is that you have completed the main part of the course because year 11 is spent a lot of time on it any days. So we've got two non-exam assessments. Um, is a scientific base doing experiments the second one which does incorporate the three-hour cooking exam so once again the amount of cooking there will pick up because pupils will obviously be practicing in school they have to do trials and then no doubt be wanting to practice at home prior to actually doing the practical exam brilliant thank you very much and can you just clarify what the percentage split is between sort of the the theory side and the practical yeah. So the written exam, which is an hour and 45 minutes, is 50% of the overall GCSE. And then the two non-exam assessments, the first one, uh, the scientific experiment one, is worth 15%. Now, this year they haven't done that because of last year missing so much um, education, but that will obviously be brought back in. And then the second one, which is the three-hour practical exam, but does also incorporate... Um, a piece of written work to go with it is worth 35%. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Uh, that's great, Miss Lua. Really, thanks for clearing that up. Um, Mr. Ryder, I'm going to come to you now. Probably, well, a really common question for uh, for you this evening, uh, and I hope that you can sort of make this as clear as possible. What is the difference between GCSE Sports Science uh, and the Cambridge National uh, PE? Yes, yeah, so I had anticipated this question uh, coming. So, I mean, the main difference is, is the sports science is very much tailored to students that are looking to uh, develop their knowledge of the sporting world, um, their body, how they can train their body to be as effective as possible uh, for sporting situations. And effectively, that is done across six units um, that are split into two uh, separate exam papers at the end of year 11. Uh, so you've kind of got the anatomy and physiology side and the physical training side, so how the body works. Um, and then on the other side of the sports science course, you've got the, the kind of the sports psychology, uh, social culture influences and and how the kind of the sporting world is developing in that sense. Now, with the, the Cambridge National, it's it's far more of a vocational course in the sense of um, the course is very much designed to develop yourself as a sports person, as a leader. Um, and it's very much directed to those that are looking to go directly into the sports industry and work in the sports industry. Um, there are less units within the, the uh, uh, Cambridge National, so there's only, only four units. And within those units, there is also um, a, a practical element uh, within the four units. Then going back to the sports science uh, side, you have your six units. And on top of that, you've got practical PE as well that you would be assessed on. Um, so, I mean, for me, the main difference is that is the sports science is about developing your knowledge of sport developing your understanding of um, anatomy, physiology, um, whereas the, the Cambridge National is much more directed to, to a vocational um, aspect of sport and, and looking to get directly into that uh, industry. Uh, finally on that, it, the, the way that the courses are assessed are very different. Um, so 70% of the sport science course is based on um, theory-based learning. So two 30% two exam papers, and a 10% piece of coursework. Um, and, and with the um, Cambridge National, it is 75% practical. Um, now, my, my advice would be, if you are umming and ahhing and you're not sure between the two, uh, my personal piece of advice, 
go with sports science. Um, it is far more tailored to meet a range of, of different kind of sporting um, backgrounds. I've seen a question come in there about what career paths are available for sports science. Um, for me, sports science will open up far more career paths. It, it is um, seen as a more academic based uh, sort of subject out of the two. Um, and in career path wise, you've got sort of the sports psychology route to go down, sports coaching, uh, physiotherapy, any sort of biology based uh, jobs. So it does open up a lot more avenues for you. That's not to say that the Cambridge National doesn't, but it is far more kind of focused on on sporting leadership, coaching, lifeguarding, those sorts of, of roles. That's fantastic, Mr. Ryder. Thank you very much for that. And there's another question in the chat, but we'll we'll come back to that in a second. We'll go to Ms. Uh, Perkis. Very similar question. Uh, what jobs and types, well, what jobs or types of job will you get from studying uh, psychology? So with a, a degree in psychology and then perhaps studying further after a degree and doing a master's degree, you would be able to work as um, a clinical psychologist, an educational psychologist. So somebody that is specialised within a certain area of psychology and then working and perhaps with people. Lots of people with psychology degrees go in and work in human resources. Um, so helping with recruitment and managing staff within um a company working for the police force so using the knowledge that you've got of how and why people behave to then help within your job within the police or within other um, public services um, there is no doing psychology GCSE you don't oh, we rephrase that you don't need a psychology GCSE to do psychology A level a lot of students will go straight in and study A level at psychology with no not having done the GCSE if you were to do GCSE psychology and then do A-level, you would find that there would be a little bit of overlap, which might be a good thing because it means that you kind of going to be one step ahead of other students on an A-level psychology course because you've already covered it. On the other hand, you might then find, well, I know all this and you might be a little bit bored doing some of the A-level because you'd be doing material again. So it's a kind of a, a choice as to which way you'd want to, to do it. Half my degree is psychology. Um, I'm a teacher <laughs> and I think there's a lot of people with degrees in psychology that may well have gone into teaching and working in so many different areas. Lovely. Thank you very much, Ms. Perkins. That's great. Um, Ms. Lua, a, a question on the Google form is what are the benefits of my son or daughter doing food and nutrition? Well, at the very, very least, they learn to cook so they can go out into the world and they can actually fend for themselves and not have to spend a large portion of their wages on takeaway foods. Um, within the course, you learn so much. You learn about healthy eating. You learn about diet um, from young children, babies up through to uh, older people. You learn how to plan um, meals and, and uh, menus you're looking um, some sort of uh, things like carbon footprint and food traveling or you look at um, into diseases so di diabetes or celiac disease or so different illnesses that people might have and allergies um, you what else oh there's so much one but I can't think of everything um, as I said the cooking skills yeah there's it's a, a very wide range of um, information they learn Lovely. Th thank you very much, Mr. That's great. Now, Mr. Ryder, we've got a few questions in uh, in the chat function. Um, Miss uh, Hockey will answer uh, the sun uh, the question regarding uh, sports science and its link to medicine. But if we could just start off with, can uh, can they choose any sport for their team slash individual sports? Or are there prescribed activities? Yes, yeah, so there is a approved AQA list of, of sports. It is really broad, um, and it is on. It's the you know the onus is on the students to choose the sports they want to be assessed on. So um, obviously, we'll be there to support and offer advice and say actually we'd we'd encourage you to do this sport because this is where we feel you'd you'd score highest in. Um, there are certain you know there are certain sports um, that um, aren't on the, the AQA list, but again, that's that's kind of very minimal. Um, and the, the likelihood is that any sport that your student or, or yourself um, sort of plays or participates in, you will be able to be assessed on. Um, I had a, a question earlier about horse riding. You can be assessed on horse riding, rock climbing, uh, skiing, snowboarding. So there, there is a huge range of sports um, that are outside, obviously, our, our curriculum. 
as much as we'd love to do skiing in school um, that, that you are able to be assessed on. Um, so it is worth having a look on the AQA website, but just to reiterate, it is um, the student's choice. They do get to choose sports um, that they would like to be assessed on. However, we would encourage, we, we are obviously there to offer support and encouragement. Um, and I think there's just one more question regarding, sorry, the medicine one you said was going to be answered. But um, ag again, the sports science will offer, um, uh, does offer a um, unit of, of work on anatomy and physiology. The Cambridge National doesn't offer that. So again, that's, that is something that is, is um, worth considering. And you wouldn't be able to do sports science and the, the Cambridge National. They are one or the other. Thank you, Mr. Ryder. Um, Miss Hockey, just before we go, I think uh, Miss uh, Perkis, if you could just quickly explain, is there a lot of essay writing in psychology? I think that my year nine students that I've currently got now will probably say yes. <laughs> um, there are long answer questions on um, both of the exam papers for the GCSE psychology, which it's not an essay as such but it is a long answer question and students will be expected to by the time that they sit their GCSEs to be able to evaluate in detail the theories and the studies that they have learnt about but it's a three-year course and we'll spend a lot of time with the students preparing them so that they are able to do that. Fab, thank you very much. Uh, that's brilliant and I know Ms. Hopper will, will take over from here but thank you. Yes, thank you very much, Mr. Ryder, Ms. Perkis, and uh, Ms. Lua, uh, for joining us this evening. I think one thing that's really worth remembering that one of the reasons we have always opted and decided to keep our options process starting in year eight is to support our students with that skill development over three years. And I think that's, that's something we decided was very particular to our students, that we wanted to help them and best prepare them to develop that very particular skill of essay writing or question answers that does take quite a long time to get to. And we really wanted to give them that time to embed the foundation knowledge in year nine and then develop that exam skill, those longer answer questions throughout the time that they are in the rest of their GCSE. Um, in terms of someone was asking earlier as well about how to balance perhaps some of the academic subjects when they're not um, a big fan of the arts and I get that not everybody likes the arts as well okay so not everybody's going to enjoy history and I'm going to enjoy geography because we're all different human beings and how do we get that balance and I definitely uh, recommend that perhaps if you haven't considered uh, sports science and they are considering medicine that that might be the nice balance to perhaps say the history the geography the MFL and the, the slightly more traditionally academic subjects they will get to do practical so it's really good for the mind and the body in that sense but they do learn I was surprised actually myself and I've been in P lessons just how much science is in that sports science GCSE so it is a really well regarded qualification and the reason why those three subjects were put together is because they actually all have a science aspect to them as well so psychology has a science aspect to it clearly um, but also so does food and nutrition um, because of the science of food and how different foods react together. Um, they do quite a lot of work around how to do you know, work with allergies and alternatives. And so it's a really different um, different kinds of courses to perhaps what we might have learned ourselves when we were in school. Um, uh, so in some of the sub questions that have come in through the chat around more general subjects as well, that one about balance. Uh, the other one that perhaps might be of interest and says, but it might be something like statistics. It might be something like psychology. It might be something like media studies. That's completely different to everything else that they are doing. And it's about having that balance. And what does it mean to know that it's balanced? Well, my suggestion, as always, and I always think that back to when I got to choose my GCSEs, and I had a much narrower choice. I didn't get, all, I didn't have all these choices, but I do feel I had a very balanced. GCSE choice so I was asked to pick and I had quite specific blocks and this was this was quite a long time ago um, but um, I was asked to pick a humanity and I definitely think that that was worthwhile and I highly recommend so a humanity and we always ask students to do one of those for this very reason I then did a language I am a languages teacher so I am passionate about that I actually did two that was my fourth choice I did two languages and that's because I love them 
And so my suggestion would be for the majority of students, they would take a humanity. I highly recommend the language because of the regard it is held by other, uh, by for the future. And I appreciate that some at the moment, there's probably a little bit of lack of confidence and that's down to having missed that contact with their teacher. And so, but that is something to really think about. If it's not for you, it's not for you. And I get that, that's not, I'm not gonna make students do a subject, it's not for them. But I do recommend, so my suggestions would be a humanity, a language, if you can do it, I would highly recommend something creative. And within that creative, I do include something like sports science, where there's that physical bat, that difference between the academic writing. Um, and so, and then for a fourth, any other subject as well. And I know for some, st some students will have been contacted by um, Mrs. Cornell, Miss Wright about Learn Plus as well. That is an option that's available for a selected number of students. Um, and you will have been contacted if that's appropriate for you and the subjects that you should be choosing around that as well. So it's about having that balance. And so I wouldn't be recommending perhaps that a student does um, and that's why we do have kept four options choices as well. We could have gone down to three and given them more time, but we've kept four. Um, if you just did history, geography and MFL, that would be very, very narrow. And I would be concerned that that doesn't have the balance within that. Um, whilst you could do history, geography, MFL plus a creative subject, that would be balanced. And it's that difference between pure academic writing if we think of it that way and another subject that balances that out with something practical as well um so let me have a little look here can you do book psychology and food tech yes you can they don't they're completely different they just have elements of science within them and i just wanted to highlight that to people that you know these subjects that you might think your know, food and nutrition it's just cooking it's not it's also about the science behind cooking and we think about when we think about heston blumenthal and how he creates food it's got huge amounts of molecular gastronomy within that and science and how that works within that um are there any there's some questions that have come through because i can see the chat is having quite a few questions come through mr wallace Perhaps yeah do you want me to do you want me to pass some questions at you um so yes. A uh, question is, can you elaborate further on further maths? Uh, does it count towards GCSE? I don't know if, that, if that's meant to be about statistics. So, uh, um, so statistics would count as one of your options. Yes, it's part of maths, but it's also a separate GCSE. So if your child chose to do statistics, they would get a maths GCSE and they would also get a statistics GCSE. When you go on to do A-level maths, A-level maths, and I didn't do A-level maths, so please... Um, I'm not I'm just going back many years when I knew it was offered and then my sister did it and you had uh, pure maths then you had mechanics and then you had um, uh, statistics as well um, so it's all part of different types of maths and when you go to do maths at, um, at uh, sixth form there are different maths courses that you can follow further maths is an extracurricular activity and they're looking the maths department at other uh, extracurricular qualifications they can offer. Further maths takes you above GCSE. Um, it gets you a qualification in further maths. It actually is a GCSE grade from A star. We generally get students, they generally get A star, A or B. Um, so you, that's what they get. So it's a level above GCSE. It's not quite as high as an AS level. So it's all these little differences between the qualifications. So it wouldn't count as an option. It's an extra one on top. And some students choose to attend the lessons to just to bolster their maths because they want to get a grade eight or grade nine and then don't sit the exam. And then some students who are passionate mathematicians or, you know, those students who want to go to highly competitive courses and highly competitive universities do it to get the extra GCSE as well. And that's another reason for thinking about some of the, the courses, you know, that further maths, if you then wanted to go and do maths at Oxbridge, and we have had students from Farnham and Meath End who've gone on to do that, it shows to the, when you're applying to those universities, you know, your passion for maths, uh, but you also your ability to uh, do a different subject at a higher level. Um, are there any other questions at the moment? Yeah, there, are, there are quite a few more. So uh, will the school be offering exams in other subjects learned outside of school, such as Arabic GCSE? Is that facility possible? So we tend to do it, as I said, mainly for uh, languages in the past. Um, and 
I do believe that Arabic is still offered as a GCSE. The only challenge we have is that we always need to find an examiner to come in and examine the student. Historically, that's been allowed to be a parent that's been then supervised by an MFL teacher. So, for example, I supervised the Turkish exam not long ago. Um, and then they prepare for it themselves independently outside of school. And then we enter them for it. We pay for that entrance um, and they can sit it at any point, actually, from year nine onwards. We tend to do it in year 10. I think in year nine, students are just a little bit too young mm -hmm. just to have that full spectrum of understanding about the GCSE and some of the content within it and the maturity to access it. So I prefer to leave it to year 10. But if they are a native speaker of another language, I recommend it. And there's a GCSE available and we can accommodate it through an examiner. Then we um, do that sort of in year 10. And sometimes we wait till year 11, they do it with their other GCSEs. But those are the kind of ones we do extra, is, a G, is, our, is the uh, extra languages ones. Brilliant. Lovely. Thank you very much. Um, a question that's uh, just coming on the chat. What happens if there is too many people wanting to do a subject? Um, we've never had that problem before. Um, I'm pretty good at forecasting how many students are going to pick each subject every year. And um, the numbers are fairly stable every single year so i've got a really good idea and we've got plenty of space in all of our subjects so i don't envisage that being a problem um so i'm not going to say that that would happen i've never had that happen um i don't envisage that happening this year and if there was i will then look at what we can do i would not the the bigger problem we have is the other one where perhaps some subjects don't get enough students to run them um, because there obviously is a financial cost to running a course for three years. And I at the moment, I'm not sure we'd be able to run a course if it only had five students who opted for it, for example. Um, and obviously that's uh, something we have to take into account to be you know financially responsible as an educational establishment. And I'm sure that you would understand that as well. Brilliant. Um, that's great. Thank you. So a, a couple of questions that are quite similar and there have been a few of this. Uh, if my son wants to be a dentist or a vet, that question's come yeah. up a bit. What GCSEs, well, what subjects would my son or daughter need to study? So if you're going to go down those science routes, the, the, the vet, the dentist, the doctor, you definitely need to be striving towards separate science. That's putting in a lot of time into your year nine science work to making sure you really understand it, that you're in the right class for that one. Then within that, you do need the academic subjects. So you need history or geography. You do probably need a language as well. You are competing against if they are highly competitive courses. Um, I used to teach in a school with a sixth form. Um, I know how competitive medicine is. You also need to be able to pass a certain pre-med exam and you probably need to do work experience as well. So think about that, because hopefully by the time you get to year 10, work experience will be back on. So do if you are wanting to go into dentistry, veterinary science, medicine, medical research, can you start thinking about where you could potentially get some um, work experience to show how passionate you are about that course? Um, you would, I would suggest, be needing history, geography, MFL. I wouldn't be necessarily recommending a BTEC or the CNAT as well. Um, just thinking about the kind of grades you need, you are going to need A level three A's or in fact A stars. And I can't couch it in any other way that they are highly competitive and therefore you need to put yourself in the best possible. Like you need to get involved in lots of extracurricular as well. You need to be more than just academic. There needs to be that other little aspect to you as well, especially if you are applying to the higher, the more competitive universities. So I definitely recommend the full EBAC plus something creative. They want to see someone with balance as well as so that they know that you've got that well-being balance as well. It's really important to have balance in your life. And I cannot stress that enough. I think that we've all learned over the last year that well-being is really important and having balance in what you do in terms of the subjects you study, how much time you put into your work versus how much leisure time you have is really important so something creative and then any other gcse for those subjects you do need four gcse's brilliant cool um so we did have a couple more that we haven't answered oh will will being a vegetarian be an issue within food tech 
that I don't think so I, I can't guarantee for certain because I think there are some certain recipes you may have to but I'm sure that you are able to adapt all recipes and part of the course is having to adapt recipes to fit certain criteria in fact I know the coursework quite often is how would you adapt it for x person for a diabetic perhaps how would you adapt it for someone who's in their 70s how would you adapt it for a child because each of these people have very very um different um requirements in terms of their health needs i can't see that being an issue at all perhaps next week in the food taster um pop an answer pop a question in for miss lua and ask her that one but i'm 99 percent sure that that wouldn't be a problem at all and in fact, you probably could come up with some fantastic recipes using the new vegetarian and vegan alternatives that are out there at the moment. 100%. I'll, I'm getting very into my vegetarian food for now. Anyway, uh, so what has happened to the social, the Northern social course from previous years? Yeah, we've um, we obviously make decisions every year looking at uptakes from previous years on whether courses are viable and whether we want to run them or not. And the um, health and social care, it really started to decline um, because the course itself changed and it wasn't as popular with students. And therefore, we made a decision not to offer it. You are still cap able to go and study it at um college when you leave and do the level three qualification or even the level two qualification in it is a highly valid qualification uh post 16 we just felt we had other subjects we could offer at this stage lovely I i'm pretty sure and i'm really sorry if i've missed any of the questions from the chat but i'm pretty sure we've covered we've covered the questions that are in there so apologies if we've missed anything uh, i'll pop it in the chat again and then we'll, we'll do our best to answer it um, I think now it's time to move on to um, the Russell Group presentation. So do bear with me while I get the technology working. Uh, Mr. Wallace will still be around, but um, he's just going to disappear off screen whilst this goes. Uh, and we I present to you about the Russell Group. And there'll be time uh, for questions after uh, as well. So if you want to pop them in the chat, I will be able to ask the question, answer the questions after along with any other general questions so um we've offered this for a number of years um because we feel that actually it's really important for students to have a clear understanding of where potentially they could end up and to aspire to do the best possible things that they can do with their lives um we know that young people have great potential um, and we really want students to realize that potential and what is out there for them so the Russell Group um, and is a selection of, of they are highly selective um, universities, and they the reason why I'm really passionate about students um, having this presentation, understanding where it can lead. So I've put some statistics on the screen. So 96% of children who've been to private school will go to university compared to only 36% of state educated children. And when we think about opportunities that are available, we might not all agree with university as being an entrance way into quite, uh, certain jobs, but it uh, unfortunately it is. And I think that that gap is really unfair. And I think that more state children should have an aspire to go to university if they want to. Um, that 48% of privately educated children will go to um, one of the highly selective Russell Group universities in comparison to only 18% from state educated schools. So yes, it's roughly 50% from each, but again, that gap is really wide. And that's not, the reason for that quite often is not anything to do with the student's ability. It's just that perhaps they don't realize it's there. And why are these universities so important? Well, the reason being that uh, students who graduate from Russell Group universities actually end up earning around 10, at least 10 percent more than graduates from other universities. So it does have quite a financial impact. There's a significant impact on people who've gone to university alone and the difference between people who have a degree versus those who don't. And I think sometimes our media can be quite different. Uh, you know, it, it portrays that you don't need to get qualifications. Perhaps there's a lot of successful people who don't have 
GCSEs or haven't been to universities, but they are very much the rarity and the majority of people who do very well have worked hard at school, have got very good GCSEs and A-levels, have gone to university and have studied these subjects and then gone on to be able to access jobs within them. Um, obviously, at the very, very top end and the elite of the elite, shall we say, in terms of what's you know the gold standard of world class universities at Oxford and Cambridge. And um, to get they are highly competitive. I mean, the Russell Group universities are competitive. These are incredibly competitive universities to get into and to get into these ones. It's not just about your ability and your subject. You need to be passionate about your subject. You need to develop a, a much wider reading around the subject you want to study to get into these two. But they also are interested in you as a person. They want a broad and balanced student. So if you're going to go to study maths at Oxford, which I do know people who've gone and done, they don't just want you to be a mathematician. They want to know that you are a sports person, that you've got an interest in music, that you um, have that balance within what you are as a, and that you are a fully rounded person, that you have interests. Um, you know, that question, or what do you like to do? Can you answer that question? What are your hobbies? What are you passionate about? And, you know, we, our passions will change as we get older. But, you know, speaking to someone who is passionate about something, no matter how niche it is, is absolutely fascinating. I love talking to students who are passionate about something. I'm always really intrigued when I walk through, when we're back to normal, and I walk through the strategy zone, and I see people playing things like Pokemon and the Dungeons and Dragons that it's not my cup of tea. It's not something I would ever go and do. But the passion and the interest they have in it just brings them alive. And I think that's something that's really important to remember, that they are looking for more than just your academics. You have to have the academics, but they want that bit more. And the other Russell Group universities are these ones here. And they're called the Russell Group universities um, because... I don't know why they've got the name Russell Group, to be perfectly honest. They probably could have looked that up, but they have a worldwide reputation. And so that's a reputation outside of this country. We have to, and I think, reflect on the fact that the world is ever more interconnected globally and that perhaps our young people are not going to be working in this country. And if they are working in this country, they might be working remotely for an American country or an, an Indian company or a Chinese company. But these universities have worldwide reputations and as excellent with ones that have excellent research facilities. They are centers of research. They do two thirds of the world's leading research as well. So all the research that's done scientific and other research that's done social research is done at these universities worldwide. So two thirds of it worldwide is done here in, in the UK. They have their own history and they have their own ethos as well. And they're all very distinct within that. And they have very, very high rates of graduate employment as well. Um, I always like to uh, show several people who've been to Russell Group Universities, some of whom we might fully expect, you know, people like Boris Johnson. He clearly he's, you know, he is privately educated. He went to Oxford. Um, um, and obviously, we've got a whole range. We've got some politicians on there, such as Sir Keir Starmer as well, um, who studied um, law at Leeds, and then Rishi Sunak, who also went to Oxford. Um, and then we've also got, I've put on there some of the big scientists that we've come to know, such as Chris Witt, uh, Professor Chris Whitty, Patrick Valance, uh, Jonathan Van Tam, and Dame Jenny Harries as well, um, who we've really got to know over the last year. All of these went to Russell Group Universities and studied a whole range of different medical based degrees. So, for example, Chris Whitty went to Oxford and studied physiology. You read Chris Whitty's education and it goes on for pages of different degrees that he's got. Patrick Valance studied medicine at Nottingham. Jonathan Van Tam also went to medicine, um, uh, not went to medicine, he went to Nottingham and studied medical sciences and then medicine. And Jenny Harry studied pharmacology at Birmingham. And then there's the ones that we're, we're perhaps not as familiar with. So Emily Sande, who studied neuroscience at Glasgow University, she's most famous for singing, but she has a, a you know quite a highly 
de well reputable degree from a very very reputable university uh jessica ennis most you know really well known for her athleticism but studied psychology at nottingham and this is why i talk about that balance between um, the sport and the culture and the academics. And then J.K. Rowling, we all know J.K. Rowling as the author of the Harry Potter uh, novels, studied uh, French and classics at Exeter University. So large numbers of very famous people uh, have been to study at these universities. So what do you need, because you are competing, and I would be wrong not to um, say that you are gonna compete against people who have been to Eton. And I would, you are equally as able to go to these universities and get these grades. And you just need to realize that as well. But to get there, you do need not just grade fours, but you would need grade fives or higher in English and maths and all your subjects as well. If you're gonna go into medical degrees, we've talked about this, you need uh, separate sciences um, as well. We do recommend that you study history or geography. Some of you might wish to study both and that you study an MFL as well. UCL actually do demand that you have a GCSE in an MFL. So just bear that in mind. So if you want to study at University College London, you would need to study um, a modern language. They want a range of GCSEs. Uh, they want that full range um, and uh, broad curriculum. They want you to be involved in extracurricular and have interests. When it's offered and up and running again, can I highly recommend if you want to go to one of these universities, you take part in Duke of Edinburgh. It's such a fantastic opportunity as well as what it brings to you. You know, this, the, the uh, charity work and volunteering at doing and for doing charity work, even if not part of the Duke of Edinburgh, just generally is an extra, is a fantastic extracurricular activity that you can do. Um, having a sport interest and, uh, you know, not everybody's sporty, that's f absolutely fine. But, you know, having an interest in some sports or doing some leisure um, perhaps playing a musical instrument or taking part in drama, taking part in the school production doesn't have to necessarily be on stage, but it could be behind the scenes and doing scenery. If you're an artist, you can do some of the scenery work for it or doing the makeup for it as well. So it's about having that very, very broad range of interests and extracurricular as well as that strong academic it shows you can balance your your life and your work life balance really really well so what kind of things do you need to study so some of the really big qualifications things like architecture we'd recommend you know you would need to study and this is for a levels but obviously helps you think about what you need for gcse so for architecture we'd recommend art maths design technology and physics Chemical engineering, you would need the sciences, physics, biology, chemistry, but perhaps also um, maths and further maths and computer science. Um, in dentistry, we've talked about the triple sciences as well and, the, and maths. Economics, you might wish to study uh, maths and history, surprisingly enough, and geography because of the impact on the economic world. In terms of geology and earth science, Things like geography and statistics might be interesting and a useful combination here. Engineering. Engineering is very much about the sciences and maths. So if you're thinking about engineering, perhaps statistics might be a good option for you here. History of art. If you're interested in art and want to go to one of these and you don't want to necessarily just you're interested in art, but perhaps aren't creative. There are courses called history of art where you learn about how art has developed over time and how to interpret art. And again, there you would want to study things like, obviously art and history, but RE would come into that because a lot of our um, art has uh, religious connotations within it. Uh, languages and English literature because they're representations of things that have gone on in stories. Law, we've talked about already, I recommend religious studies, history, geography, MFL, drama I've talked about and art. Politics, again, we're into the humanities sector. So I would recommend things like history, geography, citizenship, probably maybe even statistics now. So how you can use statistics to argue very well. We see that in the House of Commons and the debate. Um, and if you want to go into psychology, you might want to, obviously we've got psychology GCSE, the biology, the computing and computer science. So it's just a little, um, 
flavor really of what you need to think about now for how it could impact your life uh, later on. So I'm gonna bring Mr. Wallace back in and I uh, want to see if there are um, any questions for this. So there's one, has anyone from FHS got into Cambridge or Oxford? Yes, they have. Um, I think the last one was about, I think actually last one was last year. I'd have to check exactly, but yes, they have got into Oxford and Cambridge um, and they definitely continue, will continue to do so. Uh, those students who did get into Oxbridge um, uh, did have uh, fantastic academic records. We are talking grade eights and nines across the board, um, alongside a, a very broad range of extracurricular as well. So, you know, that it, it, there is something special to get into them and the reason why they're so lauded for that. Um, again, back to... Um, do you really need an MFL? Again, this is going to be up to your personal choice. I think I've made it clear that certain universities demand it. The others don't demand it, but they will look at what GCSEs you've got when you're applying for university. And we've talked about the benefits of it. So that's a decision that you then have to make and weigh up. Um, and the fact that you compete for court, you know, to get into those, univer those universities in particular, you are competing against grammar schools and private schools they are going to push their children into and they do make the majority of their students do a language at GCSE. Um, do we have any visits or links with Russell Group Universities? We do. We have done Ox trips to Oxford in the past. We do have a designated Oxford College and we've taken students to Oxford on trips um, before. We haven't gone to Cambridge, just it's a little bit further. Um, and we are always looking for different links with universities. They don't tend to do as much. Um, for younger students, they tend to target sixth form colleges far more for obvious reasons. Um, so I hope that that has been a very informative and useful evening for you. Um, I think we've answered all the questions as well from the chat. So I just want to say thank you so much for engaging with us. Um, what Can you add one thing, Miss Hockey? Um, we also do run a uh, run a program in uh, Key Stage Four called the Brilliant Club, where students do uh, do add or well, they they develop aspects of scholarship through uh, working as a small intervention group and have the opportunity to develop their public speaking and other various aspects. I mean, Miss Hockey, you know more about it than I do, but that's another really fantastic thing that we do like to try and target for our students who have those aspirations to go to Russell Group Universities. Yeah, and actually, I'd completely missed that one. I'd, and yes, I've been involved in that myself over the last couple of years. Um, the small group of students, one year they went to UCL and last year they went to Oxford and they get a graduation ceremony. They do degree style writing. Um, so it is quite challenging for those students who are selected to go in that. They've been doing it this year remotely. So they were probably writing their projects as we speak. Where they'll Hopefully they will get to have their graduation at some point as well. I can only say that if you don't know what to do as a career, please look at our GCSE Options website and careers advice. Please keep your path as broad as possible. So don't narrow it down too much and pick subjects that you think you'll do well at and that you think you're going to enjoy for the next three years. Don't pick it based on what your friends are doing um, or what teacher you think you may or may not have. Things change very quickly um, and you know things don't stay the same. So thank you so much uh, for engaging with us this evening. We will put out um, a feedback survey as we're always looking for how we can improve and make things better. But um, I've also just got a very quick message from Mr. McGuinness who would like to say a big thank you as well for the support that you've provided over the last few weeks um, during remote learning. We've been super impressed with the students engagement and their efforts which through what has been quite a difficult time for them and we do know that and we're really looking forward to welcoming them back in person it's not the same teaching to a black screen as it is teaching to a room full of eager and interested teenagers and there will be a letter coming out tomorrow with more information about that return to school and all the details within that. So thank you once again. And um, as I said, if you ever have any questions, please feel free to email me at ehockey at fhs.org.uk. And I look forward to meeting you all again in person. Thank you. Thank you very much. Cheers, guys. Thank you.